On March 18, 1990, two men disguised as Boston police officers entered the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and overpowered the two security guards on duty. In just 81 minutes, the thieves stole over $600 million worth of historic art, valued at over $200 million at the time. The Gardner Museum heist remains the biggest art theft in the world and the biggest private property theft in U.S. history, if not in the history of the entire world. And 33 years later, the case still remains unsolved. The FBI has followed tips around the world and interviewed museum employees, a variety of convicted felons, Boston mobsters, and more. They believe they do know who is responsible for the crime, who may have organized the theft or been involved in some way, and where the stolen works traveled after the heist. The problem is they have no idea where the stolen art is right now. And it's getting harder and harder to figure out where it could be with each passing year. Almost everyone who was likely involved in the Gardner heist is dead, possibly taking over $600 million worth of secrets with them to their graves. The Gardner Museum heist remains one of the most high-profile crimes in the world. Priceless works of art were stolen. And at this point, it sure seems like a very real possibility that they might not ever be recovered. Who do investigators suspect was involved in the heist and why? Could the theft have been prevented with better security? Was it an inside job? Was the mob involved? Why did the museum hire so much better security guards than they had? In this episode, we'll discuss the life of the museum's founder, how she curated her collection worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. We'll talk about the art itself, the timeline of the infamous heist, still the largest property theft in American history, and look at all the primary potential suspects, one of whom is such a silly dick. In this week's Who Done It? Are you rooting for the crooks or the cops? True crime edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Master, big time Hollywood producer who will for sure be working with award winning director Catherine Bigelow on a night which is filmed <laughs> very soon. Uh, Kyla, <laughs> Kylopod of Magnum Centipede Bug Snake Nightmare Breeder. Why did I make up a bug with a word that's so hard to say? Female aviator groupie. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod. Hail Lucifina. Praise be to the best boy Bojangles and glory be to Triple M. Uh, hoping I had fun in San Antonio and Dallas as you hear this. When this drops, I'll have just gotten back from Texas. Uh, I definitely had a blast in Sacramento and Denver. Holy shit. Almost 2,000 people to Paramount and Denver. What a rush. Sacramento, also awesome. I also know that Sacramento is not the Bay Area. I may have messed that up the other week. Uh, the Crest is a very fun venue. Seattle coming up uh, next. Both shows, I think, close to sold out, but maybe someone's uh, reselling tickets by the time you hear this. Thank you, Seattle. Pontiac, Michigan, Indianapolis. After that, I uh, think Indy it might be sold out as well. Then it's off to New Orleans, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Columbus. DanCummins.tv for tickets to these shows and more. I do have some club dates afterwards where I'm going to be uh, building a uh, brand new hour of material. If you really love stand-up, uh, fun shows to see how bits start off, how they're uh, built in the beginning compared to you know how they end up uh, for a recording. Um, and now for this week's <laughs> That was weird. Now for this week's Huh. Brand new in the merch store a brand new <laughs> tea featuring the <laughs> with the rejected marker like god damn it what the fuck is going on it, it must be china hacking into our magic database to <laughs> now they're saving everything i <sighs> head on over to bad magic <laughs> ah shit hopefully you know where to go and now it's time For some showbiz. Uh, Have you ever fantasized about pulling off a heist? I sure have. Some real life Ocean's Eleven shit. Right? Where you assemble the uh, perfect crew, make off with millions and millions. And for my fantasy, I I got one dude who's a tech wizard. Gotta have a tech wizard. A real security system expert. Some hacker who can disable things from a laptop, hijack the the cameras, run looped CCT footage instead of like real-time video. You know, deactivate the laser grid, whatever it takes. I got another guy who specializes in picking locks, like any locks, a, a mechanical savant. And I for sure have a wild man getaway driver who could win a fucking NASCAR race. I got a stealthy lookout, ex-military, specialized in covert operations, quiet, no-nonsense type. I got a cool-headed trigger man with a voice that lets you know he means fucking business. Someone who doesn't want to shoot, but if he does, he's not going to miss. I have an inside man, someone who works wherever we're pulling the heist off. 
Could be inside woman. Uh, these positions, yeah. I want a couple of sexy women on this team. I do actually now. Now that I really think about it, I want uh, you know someone who takes this inside job to uh, to pull off the heist, the long con. Someone who's not going to crack under questioning. Uh, need a need a strong fake ID contact. Not necessarily someone like on the team, but someone friendly with the team and good enough. Uh, you know, get some fake ideas that are you know solid enough to get us out of the country to start a new life somewhere, anywhere we want to go. Preferably somewhere that doesn't uh, have a extra day, uh, you know, won't extradite us back to the U.S. Somewhere sunny and warm. Uh, me and my fantasy, I'm like a version of Danny Ocean, right? I'm putting the team together, planning everything. And this heist, it's going to be big, real big to make the risk worth it. Pay out in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Enough for everyone involved to walk away with enough money to never have to work another day in their life. Enough money, you know, or jewels, gold, art, whatever, to live in luxury for the rest of our lives. Because otherwise, what's the point? And obviously we never get caught. Come on. And we never turn on each other. No one ever comes after us for the money. It's just beaches and sunsets and tropical drinks with twisty straws and sexy ladies in bikinis and easy living for the rest of our laughter and sex filled days and a lot of drugs. The best stuff, pure, uncut. All right. Again, it's my fantasy. Hello, Safina. It is a fun daydream. But would I ever really try and pull it off? No. Get the fuck out of here. Absolutely not. 16-year-old me would be super bummed out to hear me say that, but I wouldn't. But some guys have done it. Some guys uh, did not bum out the 16-year-old self, their 16-year-old selves uh, back in Boston in 1990. Guys who stole hundreds of millions of dollars worth of art and have never been caught. But still, was it worth it? Did they live out their days in luxury? Let's see how reality compares to fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time to really get into it. So how are we going to break down the heist today? Well, first, we're going to discuss the life of the museum's founder, Isabella Stewart Gardner, and what led her to establish the Gardner Museum, followed by a timeline of the uh, infamous Gardner Museum heist, which will feature a little look at the work stolen, followed by an analysis of the uh, the primary suspects. Then I'll recap and talk about the you know whole reality compared to fantasy thing, how it ended up matching up. Uh, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, located in Boston, Massachusetts, was founded back in 1903. By a woman named, of course, Isabella Stewart Pigfucker. She chose to change her last name for the museum since a lot of folks back then, and uh, they found the surname of Pigfucker uh, offensive for reasons that have never been made clear in sources. I don't get it. Uh, you know, as good a name as any in my book, but whatever. Uh, no, of course not. Of course, her last name, as I've already said, was Gardner. Uh, while the full name of the museum is the Is- Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, uh, most people just call it the Gardner Museum. But now going forward, I am guessing that at least a few people, fingers crossed, will think of it as the Pigfucker Museum. And I do have to wonder, if it was called the Pigfucker Museum, would attendance be better? A number of sources state that the museum has been beset by financial difficulties going all the way back to the, you know, 1920s. Maybe the solution to your money problems, Garden Museum, is going full Pigfucker. Uh, Isabella Gardner was a local celebrity. Back when she opened her museum, one Boston area reporter once wrote, back when married women's identities were linked primarily to their husbands, Mrs. Jack Gardner is one of the seven wonders of Boston. There is nobody like her in any city in this country. She is a millionaire uh, bohemian. She is the leader of the smart set, but she often leads where none dare follow. She imitates nobody. Everything she does is novel and original. Man, nice. How do you like to wake up and read that about yourself in the paper. I feel like that would put a little extra pep in your step for the rest of the day, right? Nice little ego stroke. How's it going? Ha <laughs> great. It's official. I'm the leader of the smart set, motherfucker. Bingo, bango. Clear on out, everybody. Smart set leader coming through. Choo-choo. All aboard the smart set train. Uh, Isabella was born on April 14th, 1840 in New York City. Uh, she was born into a wealthy family. Her dad, David Stewart, made a fortune through a variety of shrewd investments and importing Irish linen. Isabella's mother was Adelia Smith Stewart. And Adelia is described in sources as having been uh, dumb, ugly, and poor. No one ever really understood what David saw in her. Uh, You know, his friends would be like, bro, why are you wasting your life with that bridge troll? You could be hitting some top shelf puss right now, yo. No cap. You could be busting, bro. Why are you fooling with basic? You could get some straight fire, dog. Yeah. That's how people talked back then. You know, a lot like they do now. It's just uh, slang. It just keeps getting recycled, dog. No, I have no idea <laughs> what her mom totally looked like or what she was about. Uh, she looks stiff and grumpy in an old painting that's at the Gardner Museum now, but 
almost everyone looks stiff and grumpy uh, in paintings back in the mid-1800s. Uh, her daughter, Isabella, was the oldest of four children and the only child to survive into adulthood. My God, life was so hard compared to now back then, right? Even for the rich, one of four kids makes it into adulthood and that wasn't, you know, terribly rare. Uh, she was, quote, doted on by her parents. According to the Boston Women's Heritage Trail, Isabella and, uh, had Scottish ancestry on her father's side through the Royal Stuart line and her mother's English relatives immigrated to Boston way back in the 1600s and uh, settled originally in Long Island. Old money. Uh, Isabella and her family lived in the West Village where she received a private education while the West Village became known as an important landmark on the map of American Bohemian culture in the early and mid 20th century. And the neighborhood was known for its colorful artistic residence and the alternative culture they propagated. I'm not sure how artistic it was back in the 19th century. I know it became a very affluent neighborhood in the mid 19th century. And then a wave of immigrants from Italy, France, and Ireland, you know, showed up towards the end of the 1800s and changed the neighborhood a lot. Uh, wealthier residents started to move out and the seeds of an artsier, more working class crowd began to be planted. Uh, Isabella was long gone from the West Village by then. After attending an all-girls private primary and secondary school, Isabella attended a finishing school in Paris from 1856 to 1858. It's pretty nice. How cool, uh, you know, when you can pop on over to Paris for a few years when you're 16, 16 and rich. I'm guessing she had a good time. Would have probably had a better time more recently when women were no longer as judged for indulging in any kind of sexuality or youthful recklessness, but still, I bet she had fun. During her time abroad, she traveled with her parents to Italy and became interested in Renaissance art and architecture. Isabella's friend, Ida Aguiz Higginson, told her, you said to me that if you inherited any money, that if it was yours to dispose of, you would have a house like the one in Milan, filled with beautiful pictures and objects of art for people to come and enjoy. It's a nice dream. Uh, the dream of a massive inheritance, right? And if you weren't going to go out and join the workforce, use that money to fund a museum, let others experience historical art up close and personal in a way they never could if they had to buy it themselves. Not a bad thing to do with the uh, easy money you're getting from a will or a trust. One of Isabella's school friends, Julia Gardner, introduced Isabella to her brother, John Lowell Gardner Jr., a.k.a. Jack the Ripper. Or just Jack. But I do want his nickname to have been Jack the Ripper a bit before those crimes occurred over in the UK. Yeah. And then he's just like, oh, shit. But no, just Jack. Uh, the Gardner family got their wealth primarily from the Salem maritime trade and then increased it from their subsequent investments in railroads, mines, and mills. Man, if you can make that big mountain of initial money and then make the right investments, that initial fortune can build an even greater fortune for your family, theoretically forever, as long as they continue to reinvest enough of it, just money working by itself to make more money. That is true financial freedom. The ultimate financial dream. It has to feel so good, right? Being able to spend a bunch of money gallivanting around the world or something, having big custom homes built for you, eating the finest foods, while your accounts continue to grow and replace the money you spend and more. I and mean, imagine not working for a year. You're worth $100 million to start the year for easy numbers. And, and you make a very conservative 5%, $5 million on your investments of that $100 million. And you put $2 million into a new $10 million home. You spend a, another million dollars just fucking around, another million on travel. You don't work at all. And you still end up a million dollars wealthier at the end of the year. Uh, Jack Gardner was considered one of Boston's most eligible bachelors. He was born November 26, 1837. Jack's mother, Catherine Endicott Peabody, was the daughter of Salem, Massachusetts ship owner, Joseph Peabody, Joe P made a huge fortune importing pepper from Sumatra because why not? Uh, when he died in 1844 at the age of 86, he was one of the wealthiest men in the United States. So holy shit. So Isabella comes from money and some nobility, then marries into so much money and a type of American nobility. Uh, Jack was descended from Thomas Gardner, believed to be the first governor of Massachusetts due to his being uh, in authority in the first settlement that became the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And from Timothy Pickering, the third secretary of state. After studying at Harvard, Jack joined his father's trading business. On April 10th, 1860, Isabella and Jack get married at Grace Church in New York City. And then they move to Boston, Jack's hometown, and live in a house given to them by Isabella's father. Isabella's new Boston home was described as an elegant townhouse style mansion built in Boston's newest and most fashionable neighborhood, the Back Bay. For fuck's sake. Yeah, totally. Just live in a new mansion. When you're a young newlywed that your father has just given you. Some people really win the birth lottery. 
Uh, soon, Jack and Isabella's first child, son John Lowell Gardner III, a.k.a. Jackie, was born June 18, 1863. He was born a healthy front butt dump, but sadly, little Jackie did die from pneumonia March 15, 1865. Uh, not even those born into the most wealth and privilege can ever buy a true and total escape from tragedy, sadly. Uh, then more tragedy, Isabella suffered a miscarriage a year later. Was told she couldn't have any more children at the age of only 26. Um, she was told she couldn't have any more kids in the front, technically. Doctor said nothing about butt babies, uh, and she and Jack would go on to have three beautiful butt baby boys, Scat, Duke, and Dingleberry. Do I have to say I'm not? Uh, I'm kidding about that? I hope not. Uh, to further add to Isabella's personal tragedies, her close friend and her sister-in-law both die around the same time as her miscarriage. Now Isabella becomes very depressed. I mean, yeah, her son dies. Uh, her body aborts her second child. She's told she will never be able to have another child. Then her close friend dies, and her sister-in-law dies. Right, all in a very short period of time. Again, money, unfortunately, just can't protect you from everything. Fun fantasy to think that it could, though, right? Like if you hit the lotto, made enough, you know, whatever, just guaranteed smooth sailing. You just buy some super rich person protection plan and are guaranteed to be spared from any and all future tragedies. What a wonderful thing to work towards, too, uh, towards if it existed. Uh, doctors advised travel to restore Isabella's health and spirits, so she and Jack traveled to Europe in 1867. They went to Scandinavia, Russia, France, and Italy. They stayed at the finest hotels and hit the sites, and I imagine probably fucked a whole bunch, uh, which all helped improve Isabella's spirits greatly. Isabella soon became a world traveler, going to places like Egypt and the Middle East in the 1870s. All around Asia in the 1880s, she loved to travel. She kept uh, travel journals. The Gardinals traveled to Japan, China, India, you know, Egypt and more started befriending more and more local artists. She traveled to Venice in 1884, where Isabella met more artists who now encouraged her to start collecting art. Jack and Isabella traveled so much, they were abroad for a total of 10 straight years. Man, that part of their life uh, sure doesn't suck. Apparently, their parents not real concerned about either one of them getting jobs. That family money, making money, and uh, funded a decade of international travel. And it's not like they were staying in youth hostels, living on bread and cheese. This part of their life sounds incredible, like a, like a fantasy, but they're actually living it. Uh, but then in 1875, more tragedy strikes. Jack's brother Joseph dies and leaves his three sons behind since their mother is already deceased. And now all three boys are taken in and raised by Jack and Isabella. And that is super cool. I imagine some nannies and other hired help, of course, uh, as well. Uh, biographer Morris Carter wrote of Isabella at the time saying, in her duty to these boys, she was faithful and conscientious. So, you know, hey, Lucifina, good, good on her. Isabella, uh, her world traveling, now put on pause, settles in and enjoys participating in intellectual life in Boston and Cambridge, in addition to helping raise those boys. She makes quite a name for herself as a noteworthy person in Boston. She didn't fit the typical stereotype of a Victorian woman. Uh, she was described as eccentric, original, and again, a leader of the smart set. Uh, Britannica wrote about her. She adopted her... Uh, his city as her own, but Boston's Brahmin society failed to reciprocate this openness. Her household was a quiet one until the 1870s, when after a bout of illness and despondency and an exhilarating European convalescence, she began arranging social affairs that dazzled and occasionally titillated conservative Boston. A brilliant and unconventional woman, she attracted musicians, artists, and actors, and she came close to scandalizing Boston society by attending boxing matches. Hey, Lucifina! Sounds like a cool-ass person, enlightened by all that world travel. And I love what her scandal was. What? A woman? A vagina owner? Watching dudes punch each other in the face for entertainment? What is the world coming to? How scandalous. That could have led to more women watching fighting, and then it did, and then that led to women being able to fight each other today, just like men, and now, well, the world still turns exactly the same as it did before, and I guess it didn't fucking matter that those dudes were all worked up uh, for nothing. Uh, Isabella often hosted lively dinner parties, salons and lectures in her beautiful Boston home. She had a few beautiful Boston homes uh, by the time she uh, resettled there, actually. Not a big art collector yet, but she's close. In 1878, Isabella attended the readings of Charles Eliot Norton, Harvard's first art history professor. It was F. Marion Crawford, an American writer known for classic weird and fanatical stories who invited Isabella to attend the readings by Norton. She had a lot of noteworthy friends now. Norton invited Isabella to join the Dante Society as well. He encouraged her to start collecting rare books and manuscripts. And she did. She collected early editions of Dante's works. 
And then Isabella started her collection of European art after she inherited 1.7 or $1.75 million from her father in 1891. Hard to uh, properly translate that amount into today's dollars. Uh, but basically, after already clearing, uh, clearly being wealthy, she has just received the equivalent, uh, equivalent sorry, I don't know why I can't talk all of a sudden, uh, received the equivalent of an extra $60 million uh, at least. In 1886, Isabella had met a Harvard student named Bernard Berenson. Funded by the gardeners and others, Berenson now travels to Florence in 1887. He had originally planned on starting a literary career, but he found that he was more interested in Italian Renaissance art. He will become Isabella's chief art advisor after she gets that inheritance and will help her acquire many of the most important pieces in her collection. In 1896, with his help, Isabella purchased what might have been her museum's most expensive piece at the time of the heist. Uh, Titian's 1562 Rape of Europa for 20,000 pounds. Those 20,000 pounds equivalent to about 100,000 US dollars at that time. So she still had plenty of fortune left over. And it's not like the inheritance was all the money she had. Uh, I can't determine the current market value for that bad boy, but in 2011, a much, much less coveted Titian, the Madonna and Child with Saints Luke and Catherine of Alexandria sold at an auction for just under 17 million. So would the Rape of Europa go for 50 million? A lot more? It shows up in a lot of top 10 type lists of his most important works. Uh, Berenson helped Isabella acquire almost 70 pieces of fine art. She purchased some art on her own, but she usually asked male colleagues to make purchases for her because it was, quote, uncommon for women to collect art. I mean, sadly, she probably knew she would get ripped off if she did that herself or, or people just wouldn't sell to her. After Isabella purchased Rembrandt's 1629 self-portrait, she and Jack decided that they needed more space for their art collection and started to consider a museum. They chose architect Willard T. Sears to draw up the plans. Sears had remodeled uh, their house in Brookline, one of their area homes. They thought about combining two of their houses on Beacon Street, where they lived, into a museum, but Jack thought it would be better just to buy new land so they wouldn't have to give up a home. I mean, totally. <laughs> I mean, obviously. I mean, when you, you know, you want to start a museum, you don't use land. You, have, you just buy new land. You, you, you can always just buy new land whenever you feel like it and just build whatever you want on it. Easy peasy. In 1897, Isabel and Jack traveled to Venice, Florence, and Rome, and Italy to get more inspiration and materials for the museum, as one does when they just decide to build a new museum. You got to go consult those hot, hard father daddies covered in olive oil. They bought columns, windows, doorways, reliefs, balustrades, capitals, and statues from different periods of history going all the way back to Roman times. You know, time totally. Good call. You, don't, you can't go cheap with replicas. No way, Jose. Uh, you just got to gallivant on over to Italy. Buy some original Roman shit to kick off your museum. You just put it on the Amex. Pay cash. Easy peasy again. Come on. Isabella and Jack wanted to buy land near the Back Bay Fens, part of Frederick Law Olmsted's Emerald Necklace Park system in Boston for the museum. Uh, they wanted to make sure to stay away from his much less desirable Pearl Necklace Park system that was infested with shrub sluts and bush beaters and other sexually reckless types. JFK, of course. Uh, at the time, the Back Bay Fens was newly filled swampland. Pretty funny. This uh, this place is very much in the city today, but back then, not that long ago, really. Uh, back in the, a bit in the outskirts, out in the swamp. The Back Bay Fens, a.k.a. the Fens, is an urban park established in 1879. A link in the Emerald Necklace, which is about uh, 1,100 acres of interconnected parkways and waterways in Boston and neighboring Brookline, Massachusetts. It includes Boston Common, bunch of other notable areas and boston yeah today has a lot of green in it one of my favorite u.s cities uh ever since i first went there back in like 2001 it's a gorgeous city in my opinion stupid expensive to live there but gorgeous uh, sadly jack Gardner would never see his dream of a museum come to fruition he died of a stroke december 10th 1898 at the age of 61 six weeks after her husband's death isabella acted uh, on their plan and bought a plot of land in the fence she had William Sears, right, draw up the plans for the museum. There were very few buildings in the area at that time. To honor her husband, she also had Jack's body mummified and encased in a thin layer of 24 karat gold. She had his eyes replaced with clusters of diamonds and sapphires, had his teeth, uh, you know, replaced with ancient ivory found in the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh. His uh, modified corpse is still on display in the museum today. You're not supposed to touch it, but if you rub it, and lick the corpse dust off your fingers. It's supposed to give you 10 years of good luck. Uh, or made that up. I could see some really wealthy, eccentric, a uh, little bit crazy person doing something like that, though. Just mummifying their partner, putting them on display. Uh, Lindsay and I joke about doing something like that with the dogs, Penny and Gigi. 
right? Penny Pooper, Ginger Bell, having them taxidermied. <laughs> Praise the Jagels. Maybe have them dipped in bronze. You know, put them in action poses. Like Penny could be frozen indefinitely in mid-bark, yelling at us to give her even more food, like she so often does. That little creature would eat herself to death in two days tops if left to her own devices. And the Gigi could be moralized in mid-butthole lick. I do know that all dogs lick their buttholes, but Ginger, she might be in record-setting territory for how much she chronically licks hers. Like, she has to have one of the cleanest buttholes on this side of the Mississippi. Anyway, the gardeners chose the Fenway for the museum because it was a remote location, had good natural light, and, uh, you know, it was scenic and a well-manicured new park system created by Fred- Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, the Boston Red Sox baseball team's home field, Fenway Park, got its name from its location in the Fenway neighborhood of Boston, which was partially created late in the 19th century by filling in marshland or fens to create the Back Bay Fens Urban Park. A little more, little more Back Bay Fens trivia. Uh, Fenway Park is less than a mile from the Gardner Museum. Construction started on the new museum in 1899, finished in 1901. Uh, the museum's overall look was inspired by a Venetian palace. The building was designed to surround a glass-covered courtyard, which was the first such courtyard in the country. And this courtyard is still glass covered today and it is fucking beautiful based on the pictures I've seen at least. I uh, I do want to go to this museum now someday in all seriousness. Isabella was a very particular client when it came to construction. She often changed her mind during the process, made the workers undo and redo their work. Another luxury of wealth, right? Money was almost literally no object when it came to this place's construction. The design was based entirely on preference, not budget. One quote from Sears' diary shows Isabella's take charge personality. He wrote, uh, she said, go ahead and build it, the carriage shed, without a permit. If the city stops me, I will not open my museum to the public. (laughs) Uh, Isabella came to the worksite literally every day during construction, had a very hands-on approach. This museum was her baby, her passion project. There was a residence built on the grounds, and Isabella moved into the fourth floor living quarters and spent her time arranging the art galleries on the first three floors. There's still at least a residence uh, on the fourth floor, as far as I can tell. Select artists can live there as part of a literal artist-in-residency program. In 1901 and 1902, Isabella installed her paintings, sculptures, tapestries, furniture, manuscripts, rare books, and decorative arts. And then she continued buying works and changing out the installations until she died two decades later. The museum opened on January 1st, 1903 for a grand opening celebration of music, art, and horticulture. The Boston Symphony Orchestra performed. The interior courtyard uh, was unveiled. The museum was open to the public the next month, and visitors got to see what was then truly one of the finest private art collections in America. There were over 2,500 items in the museum when it opened. One interesting fact is that before the museum opened, Isabella wanted to test the acoustics, but she didn't want anyone to see the museum before the grand opening, so she had children from the Perkins School of the Blind come and sing at the museum. That is attention to detail. Holy shit. And she was so concerned with making her opening perfect, she personally killed two of those little fuckers for not singing with enough enthusiasm. And I cannot tell you how much I respect that. She was willing to do whatever it took to make her museum a success. R.I.P. Nameless Blind Kid with shitty voices. Uh, What if she really did do that and I did truly admire it? And then I get a bunch of offended emails but refuse to back down. I just keep repeating, (laughs) yeah, Agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. All right. Oh, okay. So you wouldn't shoot a couple blind kids in the face to make sure that the other ones really sing their asses off to get the acoustics properly figured out to have a kick-ass grand opening. <laughs> okay. All right. Guess we're just different that way. Agree to disagree. Uh, the Garden Museum website states uh, regarding the first couple decades of the museum's existence. Over the next 20 years, Isabella Stewart Gardner filled her museum with visual and performing artists. She organized concerts, lectures, and exhibitions, and encouraged artists to make themselves home in the museum. Isabella Gardner not only supported artists, she also supported the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Zoo, hospitals, uh, literary associations, and the Episcopal, Episcopal Church. When she died, she left money to the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, the Industrial School for Crippled and Deformed Children, the Animal Rescue League, and the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So, praise Bojangles. She was a good one. But also, Industrial School for Crippled and Deformed Children. Jesus. That language has not held up well. And where do you go to school, little girl? I go to the Industrial School for Crippled and Deformed Children because I'm crippled and deformed. (laughs) 
fuck's sake. Uh, Isabella Gardner had a massive stroke in 1919, uh, but lived five more years until July 17th, 1924, and she was 84 years old when she died. Uh, she left her museum for the education and enjoyment of the public forever. Left a $3.6 million endowment for continued museum operation, right? That money make them money. Also stipulated in her will that nothing in the gallery should be changed. Nothing. No items acquired. No items sold. Today, the rooms of the Garden Museum look exactly the way Isabella designed uh, them before her death, minus the stolen paintings and two other items, of course. But where those paintings were, the frames do remain, waiting to have that artwork put back in them. Uh, Isabella's will said that if anything should be permanently changed, the collection was to be shipped to Paris for an auction and all the money should go to Harvard. However, in 2009, a Massachusetts court overruled the terms of Isabella's will to allow for an expansion at the museum. A carriage house was demolished to allow for the renovation, and that was finished in 2012. So other than that, it's the same. And I wonder if her ghost now haunts the museum. The ghost of Isabella Pigfucker. That's a story we could tell on Scared to Death. Uh, in all seriousness, the museum is reportedly very haunted. Uh, after Isabella's death, the museum directors lived on the fourth floor for over 60 years. But when Anne Hawley became museum director in 1989, she chose not to live in that apartment. And then a mere six months after Hawley took office, the museum was robbed. Coincidence? I doubt it. I imagine whoever robbed the place saw this new opportunity quickly and did not waste time to act on it. And then in 1990, bringing us now to the heist portion of this heist episode, 13 works of art were stolen from the museum. And now, almost exactly 33 years later, as I record this, the theft is still unsolved. The Garden Museum, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, all still seeking out leads today. And the Garden Museum heist is still the single largest property theft in U.S. history and biggest art theft history uh, in the history of the world, at least the modern world. Some sites do say it's also the biggest heist of private property in the history of the entire world. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. It's a mighty big claim and hard to verify, but maybe. The Garden Museum currently offering a $10 million reward for information leading to the recovery of the stolen works, thought to be valued at over $600 million by some art experts. The FBI valued the hall at $200 million at the time of the heist, then raised the valuation to $500 million a decade later in 2000. And part of the reward will be given in exchange for information leading to the restitution of any portion of the works. So you don't have to have them all. Big payday awaits anyone able to find any of the paintings or a uh, that ancient Chinese wine bottle of sorts. And a separate $100,000 reward is being offered for the return of that Napoleonic Eagle finial. If you have information about any of this, you can contact Director of Security Anthony Amore, uh, reward at gardnermuseum.org, or you can call 617-278-5114. And I would fucking love it if somehow this podcast led to the recovery of these paintings. That'd be the greatest time sucker update of all time. And now let's begin our timeline of the Gardner Museum heist. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On June 27th, 1989, Anne Holly selected as the fourth director of the Gardner Museum. She is the first female director and selected from approximately 100 candidates. Nice. Uh, Anne stepped down in 2015 after running the museum for 26 years. The previous director, Rollin Van Hadley, retired back in 1988 after 18 years of the museum. As mentioned previously, Holly chose not to live in the fourth floor apartment, the first director to do so. Why wouldn't she want to live there, I wonder? Uh, well, she was married with a child at home and perhaps the fam as a whole, you know, just uh, didn't want to. In the early hours of March 18th, 1990, two men now pull off the biggest heist in history, modern history at least. Before we go over the theft itself, let's look at what they stole. Uh, you know, a little extra art education in this one. Not that I'm qualified to teach that, but I can regurgitate a bit of what others who are qualified have taught. They took the concert by Johannes Vermeer, completed between 1663 and 1666. The Garden Museum now values this item alone at around $250 million. The small painting, just slightly more than two feet square depicts a man and two women performing music and it was displayed back to back with Govard Flink's landscape with obelisk on a small tabletop in the Gardner Museum's magnificent Dutch room, the room from which uh, a lot of artwork was stolen. Uh, the Vermeer generally considered uh, the rarest and most valuable of the lost treasures, at least partially because so few of Vermeer's paintings are known to exist. The current consensus is 37, but some scholars have doubts about the genuineness of three of them, so just 34 
you know, universally agree that they exist. The concert was both characteristic of Vermeer and also a little uncharacteristic. At least nine other Vermeers include musical instruments, mostly in the hands of women, yet only three other surviving Vermeers include three figures. One is Christ in the house of Martha and Mary. The other two are set in a bar and in a brothel. Vermeer was moderately successful in life as a Dutch artist, art dealer, and art collector, uh, but left his wife and kids in debt when he died. He fell into near total obscurity for over a century after his death and then was rediscovered in the 19th century. And he's now considered a Dutch master on par with Rembrandt. Uh, I got to see one of his paintings in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum years ago, The Milkmaid. And his works really are striking, like a master of painting natural light falling on his subjects, incredible composition and uh, color choices. Now for another Dutch master, Rembrandt. Several Rembrandts were taken. The thief stole A Lady and Gentleman in Black by Rembrandt van Rijn, completed in 1633. Saw some of his work in the National Gallery in London years ago, also awe-inspiring. He is generally considered one of the greatest visual artists in the history of art and the most important, if not, you know, one of the most important, if not the most important in Dutch art history. Rembrandt was much more heralded when he lived than Vermeer and was an art teacher for around two decades. Far more prolific than Vermeer. He was once believed to have produced well over 600 paintings, nearly 400 etchings, and another 2,000-ish drawings. Some modern scholars now think that the true number of his paintings might be closer to 300 than 600, still much more than the 34 works universally attributed to Vermeer. All of the Rembrandts in Mrs. Gardner's collection were produced by the early 1630s when Rembrandt was only uh, 26 or 27 years old though his sensitive self-portrait, which was not stolen, dates from four years earlier. He already achieved a dazzling technical skill by that age. Uh, Rembrandt painted mainly couples, or excuse me, many couples, some in very large formats, but the vast majority of these portraits are actually pendants, two separate canvases, each picturing one member of the usually married couple. A lady and gentleman in black is probably Rembrandt's first double portrait, including both figures on the same canvas. It's impressively large, over four feet high by some three and a half feet wide. The clothing of the subjects is rich with amazingly detailed lace work, especially the woman's, uh, the woman's elegant ruffled collar and lace cuffs. Dude must have had some teeny tiny brushes and a very steady hand. Uh, they also stole Christ in the Storm of the Sea of Galilee, another Rembrandt from 1633. Four artworks to the right of the stolen lady and gentleman in black in the Dutch room. There now hangs the empty frame of arguably the most famous of the missing paintings, Christ in the Storm on the Sea of Galilee. An illustration of a passage in the New Testament, book of Matthew, chapter eight, verses 23 through 26. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep and his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, why are ye fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds in the sea. And there was a great calm. This is one of Rembrandt's most dramatic and dynamic images. The canvas just over five feet high, more than four feet wide. It's a, it's a big one. And you're watching figures being tossed about at sea at the height of a violent storm. I feel like if I stared at this one long enough, I might actually get seasick. Like it looks awful. Dark clouds glower above. High waves are lashing at the boat. The wind has already torn the mainsail in half. Jesus and his disciples are in the boat. Some of them are in a state of panic. Some of them are working to hold the boat together. One is leaning over the side of the boat about to vomit. One of them is uh, staring out directly at the viewer, holding on to his cap with one hand, a rope with the other. There's a little word bubble painted coming out of his mouth and he is screaming, Jesus, take the wheel and drive. Come on! Well, there's not that. In the midst of all this tumult, uh, Jesus himself seems to be waking up from his nap, not the least bit worried. Probably a little easier to keep calm and carry on when you know for a fact that heaven waits. When you know there's a hot, hard, heavenly father, daddy up there above in the clouds, simply dripping an extra virgin olive oil waiting to receive you. Uh, next, another Rembrandt, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Again from 1633. Busy year for that Dutch hard father, daddy. Hot, hard. Every year, a busy year from Rembrandt. Uh, this teeny tiny etching, and it is so small. It's an inch and three quarters wide by nearly two inches high. It's like a tiniest little doodle. Uh, it, it's a Rembrandt marvel, so much detail in such little space. We know from his other self-portraits and portraits of him by his students and other artists that this is what he must have looked like. He's not yet 30. He's already a successful, even famous artist and does nothing to flatter himself. He's, uh, you know, draws himself a little pudgy, a little scraggly. His hair's tousled and unkempt. Looks very serious. 
In a bill of sale, this etching is referred to as Rembrandt with three mustaches because he has a mustache on his upper lip and then some hair on his chin looks a little mustache shaped and even the brim of, the, of his cap seems to have a mustache. That's a fucking powerful dude. Three mustaches. You don't see that much man in one man very often. Next painting taken was another Dutch one. Landscape with obelisk painted by Govart Flink in 1638. I mentioned that a bit ago. He created over 130 paintings in his lifetime. Died a known and pretty su- successful artist. He was also a student of Rembrandt's for a time. And for many years, this haunting little landscape he created was actually thought to be a Rembrandt. Because clearly, this fucking copycat hack piece of shit studied well. I don't actually think he was a hack. Uh, oil painted on wood. This piece measures 21 inches high, 28 inches across. And for all of his time in the Garden Museum, it was placed back to back, as I said, with Vermeer's The Concert. A little, little table near a window in the Dutch room. The major oddity in this painting is that the obelisk uh, is, you know, that gives the painting this title. On this uh, dark and stormy day, it is streaked by sunlight, almost gilded. Yet in perspective, it's much smaller than the huge humanoid gnarled tree in the foreground. A large section of trunk has fallen to the ground, maybe struck by lightning. A little man on horseback is talking to another little guy. Sent on the road, across the bridge, on the other side of the river, there's a water mill. Against a distant horizon, a kind of, uh, you know, these, these butte towers over the fields and woods in front of it. Uh, the colors are mostly browns and grays. Bernard Berenson, that famous art historian that advised Mrs. Gardner, we, who we met earlier, called it a work of art of exquisite sweet pathos and profound feeling. Also stolen, Shea Tortini uh, by Edouard Manet. Finally, not some stupid old Dutch dipshit, right? I have nothing against the Dutch. This French fuck, Manet, completed the stupid French bullshit around 1875. I also have nothing against the French. Uh, and Shea Tortini, Tortoni, there we go. Tortoni, it's a Tortoni. I don't even think it's Italian. And Shea Tortoni, a three-armed man drinks a glass of what looks like apple juice or apple cider or maybe some kind of champagne while juggling three red apples in front of some guy named Tortoni's house. Manet loves sets of threes in his works. Tortoni watches through the window, one of three windows uh, you can see as he weeps. In the distance, way behind the house, are three apple trees with no apples on them anymore. It is thought that Tortoni cries because he's hungry and he wanted those apples. And he feels anguish because they were his apples. You know, it's fucking, it's his apple trees. But this three-armed son of a bitch, juggler, doesn't care. He's an asshole. And he's going to eat all of them. He's going to drink all the juice. And if Tortoni has a problem with that, they can fight. They can fight. Three fists against two. How do you like those apples? The juggler, he's not actually thought to be a bad guy. He's just someone who loaned Tortoni some money and he didn't pay it back. So, you know, there's interest. And if he won't pay, he's going to get his apples picked. It's as simple as that. Or he can sit in his house and he can cry like the little bitch baby Tortoni is and has always been. And he can watch a three-armed man drink his fucking juice, cider, champagne stuff and juggle his apples and then eat them slowly, but not swallow them. He doesn't even, not even hungry. He just wants to ruin this for Tortoni. He's going to spit them out in front of him and he's going to stomp them to shit in the dirt. And then, and then he's going to watch Tortoni scrape him out of the dirt once the juggler walks away a little bit and he's gonna eat him like a little fucking crybaby piggy boy that's one interpretation of this piece that's my interpretation i'm the only one that has that one everyone else in the art world seems to think that the subject matter is a dapper mustachioed young man wearing a top hat uh sitting in a cafe next to a sunlit window and he's writing something at least one of his eyes is focused on you the viewer a wine glass is on the table Probably doesn't hold a, a, a biscuit tortoni, the specialty iced mousse associated with this cafe because the wine is transparent. It's a real place. Uh, the brush strokes are broad and tactile and the pre-impressionist realist master gets a lot of life from big swaths of paint. The small canvas, slightly more than 10 by 13 inches, used to hang in the crowded little blue room on the first floor of the gardener. Manet, who was only 51 when he died, was in his 40s when he painted Chez Tortoni. Manet's known works comprise 430 oil paintings, 89 pastels and more than 400 works on paper critics were harsh on him when he was alive referring to a lot of his work as having an unfinished aspect to it in death he has been heralded regarded by many as the father of modernism or father of modern art or as a hot hard french father daddy covered in cheese and baguette crumbs uh man he was friends with an artist who had five works taken by the thieves edgar degas a noted French Impressionist uh, who actually hated the term Impressionist during his lifetime. Five different, quote, works on paper by Edgar Degas between 1857 and 1888 were stolen from cabinets in the short gallery, the passageway that leads into the large tapestry room on the gardener's second floor. They were stored with other prints and drawings and cabinets designed by Mrs. Gardner herself. 
Although he began as a painter of biblical and historical scenes, uh, Degas, like Manet, who was two years his senior, became famous for his depictions of ordinary life, most notably images of dancers, horse uh, jockeys, horse jockeys, and racing horses. The loss of three drawings of scenes with horses uh, is, a, is a significant one. Uh, the earliest of the images with horses, Procession on a Road near Florence, is a drawing from around 1857, six by eight inches in pencil and a sepia wash that gives it an antique look. The image is a small procession that shows Degas in a more historical mode. There's some sort of carriage pulled by a pair of horses. One of the small but most arresting figures is a woman holding a large umbrella high above three women who seem to be dancing. And there's an antique view of Florence in the distance. Three mounted jockeys completed between 1885 and 1888 is a larger, less finished ink drawing, about 12 by nine and a half inches, some touches of oil paint. One of the jockeys, the most clearly visible, is in a striking position on the horse, leaning back with one foot in the stirrups and the other leg stretched out around the horse's neck and has a huge cock. Uh, it's bigger than him or the horse combined. They got known for huge cocks in a lot of his small drawings. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been that would have been me and I would have get tossed I would have got tossed out of uh, an art class back then. Like even if I had talents, I'm such an idiot. I probably would just be driving like big wieners on people. They'd be like, get out, get out of here. This is very prestigious. Uh the other two jockeys on the sketch page are harder to see because they're upside down. Uh perhaps the most important of the stolen Degas, uh Dega, I just want to say gods, because there is an S. Oh, French. Is a small watercolor, date unknown. Leaving the paddock. The piece shows two horses and their jockeys lining up and being led into the track, surrounded by bystanders. Quite a crowd for a picture, only uh, about a postcard size, four by six inches big. I guess it'd be a big postcard. Uh, the final two missing works by Degas are a pair of 12 by eight inch charcoal sketches from 1884. Both studies for a program for an artistic soiree. One a little more finished than the other. A square in the lower right-hand corner is left blank, presumably the space for information about the soiree. The figures surrounding the empty space include a dancing couple pointing their toes, a woman in a tutu and toe shoes, a woman holding bound pages in one hand, the upper body of a man in an 18th century hat and wig, sailing ships in a harbor, two smokestacks, belching smoke, a lot of shit in a little square, heart potentially concealing a bass fiddle behind it with the fiddle bow, uh, bow uh, or bow illusionistically drawn over the upper part of the blank square. And Dega uh, was hated during his lifetime. He had a terrible habit of spitting while he talked, and he was a close talker. And if you dared to complain about the spittle getting on your face, spittle that was chronically built up in the corners of his mouth, he would call you a twat, and he would give you a little bop on the top of your head. But not hard enough to injure you, but hard enough to water your eyes a bit and really upset you. And Dega is the guy who inspired the term twat bopper. I'm sure you've heard that or said it yourself. You know, like, uh, Check out that twop bopper in the Affliction t-shirt. Uh, revving his engine in the parking lot like a 16-year-old when he's clearly at least 50. <laughs> Fucking boomer-ass twat bopper. No, that was absurd. Uh, Degas actually was pretty unlikable towards the end of his life, though. And all of his artist friends eventually parted ways with the eccentric, argumentative man by the end of his life before he passed at the age of 83. He became pretty openly anti anti-Semitic in addition to possessing other less than desirable qualities. Maybe didn't say twat bopper, but was kind of a douche uh, towards the end. Recognized as an important artist in his lifetime, Degas is now considered one of the founders of Impressionism. He completed and owned 626 artworks, uh, mostly pastel drawings and oil paintings. Finally, the thieves took two uh, pretty random items. They stole a French bronze eagle uh, finial from 1813 or 1814 and an ancient Chinese gu from between 1200 and 1100 BCE. Not sure on the pronunciation. I could not find a, a guide that worked for this, but it's uh, just G-U. Could be go. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary defines a finial as an ornament, ornament at the top end or corner of an object. So this 10-inch tall bronze eagle was stolen from the gardener. Uh, it formed the decorative top of a flagpole. So the top of a flagpole uh, attached uh, to a silk flag from Napoleon's 1st Regiment or Imperial Guard. 1st uh, Regiment of the Imperial Guard. Uh, the eagle stands proud with his wings spread, almost glaring. Uh, although they tried, the thieves were unable to remove the entire flag, which was in a case screwed to the wall of the short gallery. So they finally settled just for the uh, finial. The entire object hung in Mrs. Gardner's Beacon Street house before she built the museum. Uh, while the finial is gone, you know, the, yeah, the flag is still there. And then there is the goo or go, according to the Garden Museum. Uh, this 10-inch tall ancient Shang Dynasty bronze beaker was one of the oldest objects in the whole collection, by far the oldest of the stolen objects. Mrs. Gardner bought it in 1922. For $17,500, placed it in the Dutch room on a small table just to the right of the stolen Rembrandt seascape. 
The austere trumpet-shaped cup of the beaker is supported by stem and base overwrought with more intricate interweaving. And all that is what was conservatively valued at $200 million by the FBI when the items were stolen. And then just 10 years later, the sum adjusted to $500 million, now valued at over $600 million. Most expensive private property theft in U.S. history, if not world history. And now let's look at how this shit got swiped. Saturday, March 17th, 1990, 11.30 p.m. This is St. Patrick's Day in Boston, Massachusetts. And not just St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day on a Saturday. Hundreds of thousands of people are undoubtedly getting fucked up within a few miles of the museum. Police are busy responding to all kinds of disturbances, fistfights, disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, pissing in the fucking street, you name it. I mean, had to have been a chaotic, uh, you know, scene that night. Pretty good night to pick to uh, go for this heist. It was also a beautiful day, unseasonably warm with a high of 70 degrees, you know, Fahrenheit, still 50 to six, uh, 56 degrees at midnight and around 50 degrees when the thieves kicked off their robbery. At 1130, the two graveyard shift security guards show up for duty. 25-year-old Randy Hestand and 23-year-old Richard Rick Abbott. And backing these two guys up is an outdated security system. Smithsonian Magazine's Nora McGreevy wrote in 2021 that by 1990, the museum's security flaws were common knowledge among Boston's criminal elite, making it a bit of a sitting duck for a heist per The Guardian. In addition to a dodgy security system, the museum is being guarded this night by two guys who are not very good at their jobs. Not very motivated. Uh, Aren't are being paid very much. Not being paid much more than minimum wage, according to sources, either $6.85 an hour or $7.35 an hour. Sources I like best say $6.85, and that's equivalent to somewhere around $15, $16 an hour today. We don't know a lot about Randy other than he was a student at New England's Conservatory of Music. We know that neither he nor Rick had any formal training in security. Uh, We do know a fair amount about Richard, who went by Rick, as I've mentioned, but I will mostly call him Dick. This is the silly Dick. I referred to at the beginning of this episode. This is this is a character here. Uh, Dick had dropped out of the Berkeley School of Music shortly before the heist. Uh, he was playing in a local rock band called Ukiah, sometimes doing shows right before his shifts. Here's a little snippet of a song from a Ukiah show from December 6, 1989. Uh, Ukiah playing at uh, Axis, a Boston club that is no longer around. Dick fucking rocking the keyboards on this track, and this is just a VHS recording, so apologize for the quality. Stop. Sounds pretty good for a band recorded on a VHS camcorder. No, not even just doing covers and stuff, doing originals. Uh, by his own admission, Dick would sometimes show up for security guard work at the gardener drunk or stoned <laughs> after you guys show. He told this to the police just immediately. Uh, his drugs of choice were, quote, reefer and hallucinogenics. But he also liked doing a little bit of blow. <laughs> ah, fuck yeah, bro. Doing that alley coke back in 89. He said, I'd be just getting off stage somewhere and just wanted to slow down before I went to the most boring job in the world. Sometimes needed to slow down. Other times needed to pep up a bit with a few bumps of that nose candy. Uh, Dick would insist, though, that he was not drunk or stoned the night the items were stolen. (laughs) No, no fucking way. Not on St. Patrick's Day in Boston. Not on a Saturday night. Not a guy who admittedly regularly showed up to work fucked up on a lot of other nights. In a possible forthcoming book, Dick has been writing about his perspective on the heist called Pandora's Laughter. He's been posting chapters and excerpts on Facebook for years. Dick wrote that just a few months prior to the heist, he was tripping on mushrooms <laughs> the night of Christmas and led a buddy and another dude in to party with him inside the museum. He, he said that he and the other guard, unnamed, were both fucked up on gin and shrooms. He wrote, my friend Ed showed up just before dawn with someone we didn't know, an odd squirrely kid who seemed out of place and nervous. We trusted Ed but had no idea who the other dude was. They got some mushroom tea with gin and a short tour. Tour, the next shift, was going to show up soon. <laughs> so he's, take, he's taking his job real seriously. Uh, this other guard was anything like Dick, some young musician having fun in Boston, taking an easy late night gig to pay rent, right, Randy? Uh, they really had the fucking A-team working that night. Uh, who was checking up on the night shift? Apparently no one. If anyone interested in pulling off a heist knew that this guy, was one of just two security guards working the night shift that had to have boosted their confidence for a heist. 
I just, dude, I am telling you, we can rob the shit out of that place. Hundreds of millions of dollars worth of art being guarded, not at all, by Dick Abbott. Fucking Dick from Ukiah, the keyboard player, the dude I bought some acid off of a few months ago. Yes, that Dick. He's the main security guard at night. Get the fuck out of here. Dude, I'm in. My five-year-old niece could get past Abbott. Uh, We'll learn more about Dick uh, a little bit later. Let's now take a detailed look at what exactly happened the night Dick and Randy got taken for a ride, or at least the night that one or both of them helped the museum get taken for a ride, right? One or both of them could have been in on it. Okay, so again, Dick and Randy shift started at 11.30 p.m. Ricky Dick Abbott made the first rounds. Randy stayed at the security desk. Uh, the museum did not have security cameras in the galleries, had them around the perimeter of the uh, of the museum, um, and it had motion detectors inside the galleries. Outside the museum at 12.45 a.m. the morning of March 18th, Nancy Clarty and Justin Stratman, uh, two high school students at the nearby Boston Latin School, oldest public school in the nation established in 1635, holy shit, and just a three-minute walk from the museum, well, they see two men sitting in a car outside the museum. Some sources describe this car as a red hatchback. Others describe it as a red Dodge Daytona sports car. I really hope it was a hatchback. I, I would like the guys uh, to have pulled off the biggest heist in U.S. history in a hatchback. Nancy had plans to meet up with her friends that night. She was on uh, Palace Road, the road that runs right past the museum, and the street was dark and quiet. Nancy asked Justin for a piggyback ride. They started walking down the street. Justin sees the car with his lights on. When he gets closer, he sees people inside, two dudes sitting in the front seats. The glare from the street lamp obscured the view, but they could see the Boston police uniform on the shoulder of the clothing, at least what they thought was the Boston PD uh, you know, insignia. They thought that the officers were there to end a party they had been at, so they decided to keep on walking. Nancy remembered that the car was parked right next to the Gardner Museum. Uh, around nine minutes later, 12.54 a.m., the morning of March 18th, a fire alarm goes off at the third floor of the museum. When Dick investigates, there's no fire. Uh, whether or not this was part of the thieves' plan is still unknown. Uh, perhaps Dick was testing out the security system for them, see what was working. Dick finishes patrol around 1 a.m., now switches places with Randy, not Handy Randy, just plain old Randy. At 1.24 a.m., Ricky Dick Abbott is sitting at the security desk uh, when two men dressed as Boston PD officers, that's how it was reported at least, I'll explain what I'm saying there later, approach a side entrance and buzz the desk asking to be let in. They said they were responding to a disturbance call. In 2013, Abbott told a Boston Globe reporter, I could see that they had their hats, coats, and badges, so I buzzed them in. The disturbance call explanation made sense, according to Abbott, since there were all kinds of St. Patrick's Day celebrations going on in the neighborhood. Right, of course. A lot of people, you know, fucked up and whatnot, as I mentioned. Abbott may have been one of them. Uh, Dick later said he cooperated pretty quickly with the art thieves, in part because he didn't want to risk getting arrested somehow. And also because he had tickets to a Grateful Dead show later that day in Hartford. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, he will make that concert driving to it in a borrowed van. A source uh, describes this as the um- umpteenth, umpteenth time he will see them. Of course, he still made it to the dead <laughs> the night after being tied up during a robbery. This dick character is fucking great. If he wasn't in on it, I can just, I can just picture his thought process. You know, just, no, no, I'm not supposed to let him in. No, no, I'm not going to let him in. Oh, but wait. Oh, what if they arrest me for like disobeying them or something? And then, oh, dude, like no debt. And what if I hear like the dead play Dark Star and I miss it? <laughs> no, no, I, I can't risk it. I have to let them in right now. Uh, buzzing the officers into the employee entrance violated museum protocol. Dick was supposed to notify the head of security if the officers insisted on coming in before operating hours or at least ensure they had a warrant to be on the premises. Abbott later said he was unaware that the museums do not let anyone in at night ever for any reason policy extended to law enforcement. Even if he had been aware, would he have said no? This is a dude who let in some guy he didn't know to fucking drink mushroom tea in the museum on Christmas. A few sources uh, said he also let in some friends uh, on uh, another occasion for a New Year's Eve party. Just, dude, come on over, man. Oh, I got some good acid, man. This shit looks so much better when you're tripping. We'll listen to some dead. It'll be fucking great. I actually would love to overnight in a museum on acid. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, also, in August of 2015, security camera footage goes public showing Dick letting an unidentified man into the museum the night before the heist. So he didn't give a shit about the don't let anyone in rule. Yeah, he let some dude the night before the heist in the same door the officers came in, a man in a waist-length coat, upturned collar, the man is first shown on security tape, tape that had been enhanced. 
backing up his car to museum side entrance that led directly to the guard station, steps out of his car, buzzes the door on tape. Dick is seen admitting the man in greeting him briefly, reviewing a small document. The man brought with him. Uh, the pair are then out of sight for several minutes before the man walks back out. And Dick never thought to mention this <laughs> dude identity still unknown publicly in interview after interview in the first decade plus following the heist. Dick, when asked about this guy said he, he didn't remember him. Uh huh. Was he too fucked up to remember him? Does he know so much more than he has let on? What are we going to do with this dick? Uh, he also let that dude in when the security officer working with him that night was out walking his rounds. Right? And the guy only stayed a few minutes, so the other security guard never even knew that someone had been let in. Dick is, Dick is big time sus. Back to 1.24 a.m. on the 18th, Dick lets in two guys dressed like Boston PD through the side door because he thinks they're cops and because he's Dick and he'll let almost anyone in and he wants to make sure he can go to the fucking Grateful Dead. Uh, once inside, one of the two men tells Dick, according to the uh, answers he later gave police, that he looks familiar. Dick is sitting at his security desk, the only place in the museum equipped with a panic button that, if pushed, will send a message to the police to have them come over immediately. The officer then tells Abbott that he thinks he knows why he looks familiar. He thinks he has a warrant out for Dick's arrest. And then Dick, in some kind of attempt to clear this case of mistaken identity up, maybe he does think he has a warrant out for him, uh, he gets up from his desk when the officer tells him to uh, stand up against the wall. I can see him, you know, assuming that he was high when he got the ticket and just forgot about it. The officer tells him uh, to put his hands behind his back. He does as he's asked and is promptly handcuffed. Moments after he's handcuffed, trying to figure out what's going on, Randy Hestan walks into the security uh, office. Some sources say that uh, that Rick, Ricky Dick, called him in there before they handcuffed him. So Randy's fresh off a round of checking the building's three museum floors. Randy later told Boston radio station uh, WBUR, I'm just standing there with my jaw open going, wow, what's going on? What did Rick do? Randy now also asked to stand against the wall. He does as he's told uh, and is handcuffed. And Randy, just like Dick, uh, not really trained as a security guard. They don't know what the fuck is happening. Uh, or, you know, one or both of them are in on it. Dick later says that after they handcuffed him, that's when he realized, oh shit. <laughs> this is his quote too. Oh shit. These guys might not be police officers. Moments after realizing this, one of the two thieves says, this is a robbery. Don't give us any problems and you won't get hurt. And then Randy says, don't worry. They don't pay me enough to get hurt. <laughs> uh, these two guards weren't in on this. Uh, the guys who did rob the place must have either known how fucking terrible these two were at their jobs or they hit the all-time jackpot when it came to getting lucky with, a, with two really shitty museum security guards. Rick and Randy's heads are now wrapped up with a bunch of duct tape and they're taken to the basement. And it's so weird how they were like taped up or at least how Ricky Dick was taped up. In books, on cable news reports, uh, and in newspaper accounts following the heist and a lot of, you know, TV, you know, kind of coverage, the guards have been variously described as having been gagged, almost gagged, uh, left nose holes for breathing, as well as having their mouths taped shut with tape around their mouths and ears and everything. And it seems as if that was true for Randy, but not for Ricky Dick. Museum security director Anthony Amore will say in 2015 that Abbott remained taped up for evidentiary reasons. Officers wanted a Boston PD photographer. Uh, to document how the thieves had taped him up. So, you know, like after the officers, you know, find him and rescue him, they're like, okay, we got to leave you like that until the photographer gets there. The guy takes some photos. Those photos are later made available to the public and you can find them online and they wrap tape under his jaw and like circled up, like up around his head. And then they did another row of tape, like wrapping it around his head perpendicular to the first band kind of going around his nose and no tape over the mouth. No tape over his eyes. Like, I don't even know what the fucking point of the tape they put on him was. In March of 2017, Amora will say that Randy was gagged. Uh, why was one guy gagged and the other uh, was not? That's never been properly explained. Also very odd, while Randy was handcuffed to a sink, uh, Ricky Dick was just left to sit on a concrete ledge, not tied to anything. Like, why not tie both of them up to something? Why let the guy who can fucking see and scream be the one to also be able to walk around or kind of walk around? He did have duct tape wrapped around his ankles, tying his legs together. But still, I feel like he could have gotten out of that, uh, you know, before the police came. Randy later said regarding the dude who had tied him up, he was real calm and real nice about it. And he also several times said, sorry to have to do this. So strange. The robbers are now thought to have split up based on motion detector reports, primarily going to the second floor to grab some art. On the second floor, one of them sets off an internal alarm. That alarm is used to alert staff. 
but someone had gotten too close to the artwork. The robbers find this noisy alarm and smash it to shit. Motion detectors that the thieves did not locate or destroy show that the thieves spent 34 minutes in the galleries taking what they took. 2.28 a.m., the two thieves check in on Rick and Randy. Then they head to the security director's office, take the VHS tape of anything the security cameras have picked up to, uh, you know, go destroy it. Uh, they're not wearing masks. Easy to understand why they would want or not want anyone to see their faces other than the guards. I was kind of surprised to let the guards see their faces, but I'm guessing that they didn't want to be seen approaching the museum side door, you know, the outside door in masks. That would kind of blow their cop cover. That would possibly lead to a witness calling the cops before they even got inside the building. Uh, and they may have also had fake mustaches and other, you know, disguise elements on their face. At 2.45 a.m., the two thieves leave the museum and hop in either a red sports car or a red hatchback. Again, I really hope they put it away in a little four-cylinder car with hundreds of millions of dollars of art in the back shitty seat. Uh, before leaving, they reportedly told the guards, you'll be hearing from us in about a year. Ricky, Dick, and Randy were now trapped in the basement for almost six hours. But, you know, only kind of trapped if, uh, you know, uh, Dick is not fully tied up, which he's not. Why didn't he try and get the tape off his legs? Uh, the tape didn't cover his eyes. You know, if he could have made it over to a phone, he could have figured out how to call the police somehow, wouldn't even have to use his hands. Uh, the morning shift security guards find these two all-stars around 8.15 and call the police. Uh, Karen San Gregory was one of the morning shift guards. She was later interviewed about coming into work that morning. She said that one of the guards normally buzzed her in, but nothing was happening that morning, which was unusual. She called the chief of security, told him that she and her coworker couldn't get in. Then he showed up just minutes later, took them around a back door. They went inside, immediately knew something was wrong. She said the cameras were uh, turned. The office door was busted. There was an empty frame in the office. That's crowbar leaning against the wall. Chief handed Karen the crowbar, told her to hold it in case she needed to defend herself. They were not packing guns. Then he picked up the phone and called the police. Karen said it seemed like all he could say was, I'm calling from the Garden Museum. We've got big trouble. We've got big trouble. The police arrive quickly. Um, they don't immediately know where Rick and Randy are, and then they find him in the basement tied up but unharmed. The police and some additional museum employees now assess the damage. The surprise the burglars also left behind one of the most, if not the most expensive piece of art, right? That Titian's Rape of Europa. Maybe too big. Measure 70 by 81 inches. Uh, a bit bigger even than Rembrandt's Christ in the Storm of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, maybe just a bit big to fit in that hatchback. The small 10 by 13 uh, Manet painting was taken from a downstairs gallery, last entered by Rick Abbott, the last painting believed to be taken and the only one from the first floor. It was cut out of the frame and the frame in question was left on a chair in the security director's office. I'll explain later what I mean about, about Rick being the last one there. Uh, Robert M. Poole of the Smithsonian Magazine has stated that the random assortment of stolen works has confused investigators. Writing what continues to perplex those investigating the Gardner mystery is that no single motive or pattern seems to emerge from the thousands of pages of evidence gathered over the past 15 years. Were the works taken for love, money, ransom, glory, barter, or for some tangled combination of them all? Uh, Tron Brecky, a uh, uh, section chief for FBI Boston, one of the first FBI agents on the scene, spoke about the heist in the Netflix This is a Robbery docuseries. Uh, Brecky or Breck was confident that uh, this was not some crime of opportunity. He believes that someone or a few someone's definitely planned this all out. Based on the work stolen, it mostly seems like they had information about what to look for, but that Napoleonic uh, finial was confusing. Why was that relatively worthless item taken out of all the priceless art that could be taken? Just a random impulse? Why was the Chinese beaker stolen? Compared to the other works in the museum, it didn't have uh, nearly as much value. And as I mentioned, why did the thieves leave behind Titian's The Rape of Europa? And they left behind a uh, Rembrandt self-portrait. Also, the tiny Rembrandt etching, that portrait of the artist as a young man, that little three mustache piece less than two by two inches, it was in a fucking tiny ass frame, but someone still took the time to unscrew the frame and only take the etching. Why do that? And many of the works were not only very valuable, but also very well known, so much so that they couldn't easily be sold. Agents wondered if perhaps some wealthy individual hired the thieves to take it for their own private collection. The police were initially suspicious of the guards. And not just Dick and Randy. Well, they were mostly suspicious of fucking Ricky Dick. Uh, how, could they, how could they not be? But also suspicious of various other guards. Many of the guards in the museum at that time were in their late teens or early 20s. Uh, many were art students from local schools. There was a high turnover rate. It could have been a current employee or a former one. Maybe someone who used to work there uh, really knew how much of an idiot Dick was. And that gave them the confidence to pull off a major heist. According to the Boston Globe, two current guards and a former guard who worked the noon to 5 p.m. shift said that they were only ever trained on the job and just over a five-day period. Again, no formal training. 
said they mostly just watched videos about recognizing and dealing with situations that could lead to the theft or damaging of artwork. Night shift guards were sometimes taken from the day shift and given some sort of additional training, uh, but not always. Uh, The guard interviewed didn't even know what that training was. The Globe also reported that Director of Training William Herman uh, extensively works with new guards to ensure that they have good knowledge of the Fenway facility and of the rules and procedures in place there. Uh, Aaron Fannin, a former guard at the museum, said in the Netflix docuseries, if you got a call to work overnight, you were happy to do it. It was kind of a treat. Right? All the lights were turned off at night. Guards had their flashlights and a walkie-talkie. They made their rounds to the museum, then sat at a desk just to kind of wait for something to happen. But almost nothing ever happened. I bet that shift was a good way to get uh, paid to sleep a bit, maybe read a book, do a little homework, listen to some tunes. Abbott was, of course, quickly pegged as the primary suspect by local law enforcement for a variety of reasons. He had let people in before. Uh, He withheld information about, you know, letting people in. He had admitted to showing up to work drunk or high. He had money problems. Dude had to borrow a van to make it to that Grateful Dead uh, concert the day, uh, you know, after the heist, or I guess technically later in the day of the heist. Uh, He regularly worked the night shift. He just seemed fucking shady. He wasn't handcuffed to anything. He was the one who uh, let the two thieves in and on and on and on. To this day, it seems like the only debate concerning Abbott is is he an art thief or is he just a fucking idiot? Uh, if not Abbott, investigators thought there was a good chance another guard or former guard or multiple guards or former guards had something to do with the robbery. Heist at this level usually need an inside source so the thieves know what alarms to avoid setting off, etc. The Boston Globe reported, the thieves exhibited working knowledge of the museum's security system by removing videotape cassettes that would have shown their faces and movements. Such knowledge would suggest inside knowledge of the museum's security apparatus, a security specialist said. Yeah, or, or, fucked, or just dick told him whatever they wanted to hear. Uh, Abbott, of course, denied involvement in the heist. And he has been generally cleared, although not totally cleared, as a person of interest since 2015. Uh, Abbott told NPR in 2015, I was just this hippie guy who, <laughs> who wasn't hurting anything. Wasn't on anybody's radar. The next day, I was on everybody's radar for the largest I- art heist in history. It's pretty funny as he's saying that, too. He's still got, like, super long hair and he's wearing a tie-dye t-shirt. Uh, he, Richard Abbott, uh, gave the following statement about how the robbers tricked him, which was played in the first episode of Netflix's, uh, this is a robbery. I could see on the security camera that there looked like two cops standing out there. They came to the door, they rang the bell and they said, Boston police, we got a report of a disturbance on the premises. I buzzed them in. They asked me if I was alone. And I said that, no, my partner was off doing a round. They said, get him down here. The cop turned to me and said, don't I know you? Don't I recognize you? I think there's a warrant out for your arrest. Can you step out from behind the desk? And they said up against the wall, the guy who was dealing with me was taller and skinny. He was wearing these gold frame round glasses, if I remember correctly. He had a mustache. It looked really greasy. It was probably a fake mustache. And he handcuffed me, cuffed my partner, very dramatically said, gentlemen, this is a robbery. The first suspect was described as a white male, early 30s, about 5'10", 160 pounds, dark hair, gold wire rim glasses. Second suspect described as a white male as well, early 30s, about six foot with dark hair. Most of the description came from Randy because Dick suspiciously hours after it happened, uh, all of a sudden couldn't remember what those guys looked like. His memory got a little better years on out after the statute of limitations ran out. I picture him checking his watch during interrogation and doing the math in his head about how much of that dead show he's going to miss. If this all, if this all takes too long, right? Just, Oh yeah. Um, what did he look like? Oh man. Oh man. Hey, Oh, Hey, have you ever heard Stella blue live? Or, or, or like, uh, and we bid you good night. Who? Oh, the dead man. What? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, two, uh, two white dudes. Uh, dark hair, maybe. Um, one of them, one of them had glasses, like, like a wire frame. And uh, uh Jerry Garcia, he, ah, man, he wears glasses. Easy win, man. God, I hope they play easy win. Come on, dude. Uh, adding more suspicion, Ricky Dick finished his rounds about twenty five minutes before the thieves came to the door and were let inside. Somebody took the printout paper from the museum alarm system that logged movement data from the motion detectors, but the data was stored in the system's hard drive. The uh, Shade Tortoni, a Shade Tortoni, was the only piece taken from the first floor in the blue room, and sensors logged uh, Ricky Dick's, uh, Ricky Dick Abbott going into that room it, at 12.27 a.m. and again at 12.53 uh, when he's doing his rounds. And then he went to sit down at the desk at almost exactly 1 a.m. Based on motion detection alarm system data, the robbers never entered the room after arriving. So this means that there was either an unexplained system malfunction on the first floor or someone took the painting before or after, uh, you know, the robbers were in the area or after the police got there, possibly. 
So was this a crime of opportunity? Some think that uh, at the very least, Dick might have fucking swiped that man a been like, well, fuck, you know, they don't know exactly what the guys took compared to what I took. There's no security cameras in here. And just grabbed himself a little painting. Oh man, I can, I can, oh, I can buy so many dead tickets for this. Dude, it's going to be so great. Uh, March 19th, 1990, Boston Globe article uh, says act, acting curator Karen Haas says that the $200 million FBI initial estimate for the stolen artwork is conservative and that the worth of the art could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. It is so hard to ever determine an exact value since you never know who might show up at an auction. If you do sell it, you can't precisely determine how the bid's going to go. I mean, this is art that's considered priceless by many. Some of the pieces stolen have not been uh, for sale, excuse me, in over a century. Uh, again, the, the value to private collectors is, you know, never totally known. Now the value of the work's taken, you know, again, believed to be around $600 million. Uh, Initially, law enforcement were trying to learn whether the robbery was staged for ransom or intended to get the art for a private collector. Private investigators and art experts experts uh, theorized that the works were probably contracted for in advance by a black market collector outside of the country. This is per the Boston Globe. Uh, the specific works taken indicate that one particular buyer's taste may have been indulged. Somebody who likes a lot of French, quite a bit of Dutch, a little bit of ancient China. Uh, March 19th, museum spokesperson uh, Barry Wanger. Yes, Wanger. Uh, not Wagner, Wanger. Mr. Wanger announced that really unfortunately the art had not been insured for theft. Wanger said that the cost of the theft insurance would have been exorbitant and probably would have cost more than their $2.8 million annual operating budget. Additionally, yeah, it was just too expensive to insure. Additionally, there was a uh, disturbance outside the museum two weeks before the robbery. Investigators were trying to determine if the thieves staged that disturbance to try and get inside the museum. At least three people participated in the disturbance outside the museum in the early morning hours. One person beat on the security door, same one the thieves entered through pleaded to be let in to escape attackers. When the guard refused to allow the man in, the man got into a car with his supposed attackers and they all drove off together. Uh, surprise, they weren't let in. Dick must have not been working that night. Two men posing as police officers had also attempted to enter Boston Museum of Fine Arts two months earlier on January 15th. The museum was closed for Martin Luther King Day. According to MFA Chief of Security, William McAuliffe, they asked one of our guards to let them in, that they were responding to a call. And our guard said, I'm gonna have to get my supervisor. And when he did, the cops, quote unquote, left. The MFA was trying to determine if those guys were really police officers or not, or if they were possibly the same thieves that try, that did take uh, you know, the, the art from the gardener later. They've never figured that out. Or if they have, they haven't said anything publicly. March 20th, 1990, a million dollar reward is offered by the museum for information leading to the safe return of the stolen works. And Holly, again, that museum director, said that the reward would be guaranteed by Sotheby's and Christie's of New York, and unidentified private benefactors are willing to contribute. So maybe more than a million. Sounds like the pot was getting sweetened. All, she also announced that none of the, the staff were questioned as suspects. But come on, Dick was. Dick was for sure a suspect. Still is. Holly also said that the reward would be paid out. No questions asked, even if the information came from the thieves themselves. The FBI said that the frames from the missing artworks had been sent to their Washington, D.C. lab for analysis and a Boston police sketch artist was working on composites of the robbers. Hopefully they didn't use too much of Dick's information for the composite. I, I picture just based on Dick's description, one of the robbers happening to look exactly like Jerry Garcia. And the other guy looks exactly like Bob Weir. Just, whoa, whoa, man, these guys, oh, whoa, they look like the dead, man. Hey, you ever heard China Cat Sunflower alive? Uh, rolling right into, uh, I know you, writer. Oh, it's like God's playing you music, man. Uh, agents continue to interview museum personnel, anyone connected to the museum. Investigators received many tips, some of them highly credible, uh, but were unable to find the thieves. As the days, months, and years passed, the case only became more difficult to solve, and then the statute of limitations for this robbery ran out in 1995. That's wild to me. Just five years, right? You can steal all this shit, and then if you can keep it hidden for five years, you can just give it back, and they give you a million dollars. And then, the reward is increased to $5 million in 1997. So if you hold it for two more years, you get four more million. That is some nice appreciation for some theft. Uh, March 18th, 2013, the FBI, the museum, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Massachusetts publicly restate that the $5 million reward is active at a press conference on the 23rd anniversary of the heist. A uh, special agent in charge of the Boston field office, Richard, got another dick. Uh, the lawyers said, today we are pleased to announce that the FBI has made significant investigative progress in the search for the stolen art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. We've determined in the years after the theft that the art was transported to the Connecticut and Philadelphia regions, but we haven't identified where the art is right now. 
And that's why we are asking the public for help. So did you make significant investigative progress? Uh, It sounds to me like you made no progress. Uh, Good news, everyone. Several years ago, we were able to narrow down where the pieces of art uh, are. Uh, uh, They were either somewhere in the state of Connecticut or perhaps around Philadelphia, possibly spread out between both of those areas. So are you narrowing down the location then uh, and uh, have a good chance of finding it? Oh, no, God, no. Uh, We don't have a clue where it is now. We're just pretty happy that we used to kind of maybe know where it was. Fuck does that matter? Uh, Special Agent Jeff Kelly in charge of the FBI investigation said, with these considerable developments in the investigation over the last couple of years, it is likely over time someone has seen the art hanging on a wall, placed above a mantle, or stored in an attic. We want that person to call the FBI. Yeah, shit, yeah, get that $5 million. Anthony Amori, Chief of Security for the museum, explained to the museum again, offering that $5 million reward for information that leads directly to the recovery of all of our items in good condition. What that means is that you don't have to hand us the paintings to be eligible for the reward. We hope that through this type of public campaign, people will see how earnest we are in our attempts to pay this reward and make our institution whole. And it is interesting for this institution because they can't just like replace that either with their endowment, right? The way that the will is stipulated, they're supposed to just, you know, not procure more art. So it just does leave a hole in their, uh, you know, what they're able to show. Uh, Late March, 2015, the FBI releases the names of the two main suspects long believed to be the guys who stole the art. George, uh, it's Reisfelder, George Reisfelder and Leonard DeMusio, also known as Lenny. Both men resemble initial police sketches. However, they both also died within about a year of the the heist, just a little over the year. Uh, So this does not help much concerning the current whereabouts of the pieces. But as you'll see after the timeline, these two dudes were connected to some mob dudes who were connected to more mob dudes, etc. So, you know, maybe they could, uh, through investigating these guys, can uh, find out where the art eventually ended up. Uh, And it does seem that the mob was involved. Ricky Dick, Cherry Garcia might have helped. And the two fake police dudes uh, might have been working with uh, likely mafia associates. And even though they're dead, this could all like, yeah, again, lead to finding it. Uh, the two men were part of the Carmelo Merlino crew. Merlino was a local mob guy. First mentioned as being connected to the case in 1992. Uh, Reisfelder was described as a career criminal that had been cleared of a murder charge in 1982. With the help of his lawyer, former Secretary of State, John Kerry, uh, presidential candidate, uh, Reisfelder died of a cocaine overdose in July of 2001. And then uh, Demuzio was shot to death in East Boston the previous month in what looked like a mob hit. And then Carmelo Merlino, he died of diabetes four years later in 2005. More on this crew uh, in a bit. March, or excuse me, May 23rd, 2017. The $5 million reward is doubled to $10 million. The museum said in a press release, uh, the increased offer is available immediately and hires and excuse me, and expires at midnight on December 31st, 2017. After the announcement about the increased reward, dozens of tipsters called Chief of Security Anthony Amore, but most of them had only unsubstantiated theories. However, he did say that some callers were credible and helped fill in some blanks. Amore told the New York Times, I have a better picture of what happened, where they moved, perhaps, but not a better sense of where they are right now. So still, nothing. Uh, in 2017, the FBI announced that it sent a uh, crime scene evidence to the lab for retesting, but the duct tape and handcuffs used to restrain the guards disappeared. Uh, three people familiar with the investigation informed the Boston Globe that the FBI lost the items. <laughs> Can't find them. Whoops. Two people said the items have been missing for uh, over 10 years. FBI spokeswoman Kristen Satera said that the FBI completed DNA analysis of some evidence in 2010, uh, but did not say what items were tested or what the results were. January 2018, the Museum Board of Trustees votes to extend the $10 million reward for the successful return of the 13 works of art. President of the Garden Museum's board, Steve Kidder, said, This reward demonstrates the commitment of the museum and its board of trustees to the recovery of these important works. We are the only buyer for these works, and they belong in their rightful home. To this day, no one has given the information necessary to claim the reward, though. None of the items have been recovered. Uh, again, as I mentioned just before the timeline, that reward you know, still being offered. Uh, yeah, according to the museum's website, uh, gardnermuseum.org, it says the museum is offering a $10 million reward for information leading to the recovery of the stolen works. A share of the reward will be given in exchange for information leading to the restitution of any portion of the works, a separate reward of $100,000 being offered for the return of that Napoleonic Eagle finial. Anyone with information about the stolen artwork should contact the Garden Museum directly. Confidentiality is assured. And you just contact Anthony Moray, Director of Security, Call him 617-278-5114 or email him reward at gardenermuseum.org. And so that as I record this episode, yeah, that reward is still very active. And that takes us 
out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Uh, now let's look into the list of primary suspects. We will start with Ricky Dick, but then we will move on to a bunch of mob guys, mob associates, and uh, some some random outliers. Uh, but first, one of my favorite sponsors returns after being away for far, far too long. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Whipple Chill, Ricky Dick's Mushroom Tea Edition. Hey, man. Got a long night ahead of you at the museum. With a library, or just uh, anywhere, man. Sometimes life, it just comes at you too fast. Sometimes you're you're just too hyped from keyboarding with the band or something, you know? When you want to shift out of the fast lane and stop and smell the roses, drink Whipple, a chill. Get low with the new Elevator Music Museum melatonin flavor of Whipple. A chill. And yeah, baby, that's jazz. You can listen to it. Don't call 1-800-GIN-JAZZ, baby. Dementia jazz mania, that ain't no thing. Whipple, a chill. Ricky Dick's mushroom tea edition is totally safe. And made with a patent pending FDA approved ish formula of 30% opioids 40% whatever's in NyQuil 30% Valium baby 25% saxophone you hear it another 25% Xanax 30% warm milk 2% lavender essential oil 3% CBD cream 14% massage lotion from this lady who lives down the street calls herself Moon Goddess. 7% Kenny G sweat, baby. 18% horse tranquilizers. 20% chamomile tea. 10% melatonin. And another 50% mushroom tea, baby. Don't worry about you or your family getting fucked. Just come sit on this here cloud and calm down. Feel like a unicorn getting hugged by a rainbow. Maybe see a unicorn getting hugged by a rainbow when you drink a Whipple. Chill. Ricky Dick's Mushroom Tea Edition, baby. Whipple Chill is owned and distributed by Bear Evil Incorporated. Well, all right. Uh, That sounds like a great way to wind down at the end of the day. Good for Ricky Dick. Uh, Speaking of Ricky Dick... Rick Abbott, again, has never been officially crossed off the list of suspects. Possible he stole the Manet, Manet painting, but didn't steal the other paintings that mentioned, right? Perhaps before the thieves showed up, thieves he may have been helping, he went and grabbed that. Maybe that was his payment for helping out, or maybe uh, after the thieves fucking left, and he's, you know, got some time there to pretend to be all tied up. Maybe he goes, takes that, hides it, wraps himself back up, and then waits for the police. Or he was just a spaced out hippie that actual criminals took advantage of, or that. Anthony Moria stated that the Manet is emblematic of the whole investigation. The deeper and deeper you dig, the more questions are raised. If Dick did take the artwork or was paid to help, he has sure done a good job of hiding his involvement for a guy who doesn't seem real smart. As of 2020, Abbott was working as a teacher's aide in Vermont. In picks, he he does not look like a guy swimming in money. I'll say that. He looks like a dude still borrowing vans to go to uh, concerts. Maybe Dead & Co. instead of The Grateful Dead now. Uh, he's still wearing tie-dye t-shirts, as I mentioned. Uh, still has the basic same look as he had when he was playing with uh, Ukiah. Looks like he still lives in a cloud of weed smoke and psychedelics. In the fall of 2012, federal prosecutors grilled Abbott about why he was detected by the motion sensors on the first floor when the thieves were not. Why he opened the side entrance door minutes before the robbers arrived. Right, some 20 minutes before, right, the thieves approached the door. I don't think I mentioned that. Uh, right after completing his rounds, Rick opened and closed that door quickly, just before he switched spots with uh, before he switched spots with his partner. Abbott later explained, I did it to make sure for myself that the door was securely locked. (laughs) What? I don't know what the others did, but I was trained to do it that way. (sighs) Oh, Dick, you sound so suspicious constantly. Investigators wonder if he was testing the door to make sure it didn't set off a crazy alarm before he then opened it again later for the fake officers. 
Uh, Abbott said that security logs would show he tested the door on other nights. But yeah, maybe also, again, prepping for the robbery. In March of 2013, Abbott spoke publicly with the Boston Globe to uh, try and profess his innocence again. Excuse me. He said that he opened the doors for the fake officers that fateful night because he was intimidated by those two men. And he pointed out that he has passed two polygraphs. And he admitted he can't ex- he can't explain why the motion dissenters uh, detected footsteps when he was in the room on the first floor where the man A was taken, but not when the thieves were in that room. Abba said in an interview, I totally get it. I understand how suspicious it all is, but I don't understand why investigators think that I should know an alternative theory as to what happened or why it did happen. Uh, two more hmm situations with Dick before we move on. For a while before the heist, low on cash, he had monthly keg parties to make extra money. Right, typical kind of college party shit. Buy a keg, sell red solo cups for five bucks each to anyone who wants one, all they can drink. Some of the guests at these parties were fellow gardener employees. And they often apparently openly talked about how inadequate the security system was. And Abbott has said, could someone who had friends who were robbers or in the underworld have heard us complaining about how awful the security system was? Absolutely. We were talking about it in the open all the time. Why would you do that? <laughs> but did I know someone picked it up? And used it to rob the place. Absolutely, it just. But it's so fucking dumb. We were doing that all the time. That is, if your job is security, you're working in security, and then your free time, you're just like, man, someone could sure rob the shit out of where I work. <laughs> Easy, anytime they want. Our security system is shit at the place that I work, where I'm fucking drunk and high all the time. I don't know if I was someone else, I'd sure rob the fuck out of me. Like, who is this guy? I don't know. Maybe some mafia associates. I heard about security pro- problems uh, thanks to these keggers somehow. Uh, and last thing, Abbott had put in his two weeks notice apparently just before the robbery. Again, hmm. Now enough about silly dick. What other suspects are there? Well, a bunch of organized crime guys mainly. The FBI got close to figuring out where the artwork was allegedly and who stole it in 2003 when they heard from reliable sources that two mobsters exchanged some of the artworks in a parking lot in Maine, but they don't know what happened after that. And now there are some theories that the art is in Europe. Charlie Hill, retired art and antiquities investigator with Scotland Yard, believes that the art is in Ireland right now. Uh, Hill became a private investigator after 20 years with Scotland Yard and helped recover famous works like The Scream in the past. Right? Let's summarize that real quick. Uh, That painting has actually been stolen twice and recovered. Hill helped with the first recovery. February 12, 1994, uh, opening day of the Winter Olympics in Lillehammer, Norway, that morning, a couple of hours drive to the south in the nation's capital of Oslo, two men stole Edward Munch's infamous painting, Edvard, uh, The Scream, from the National Gallery. For part of the Olympic festivities, the 1893 portrait of a panic attack had been moved from where it usually hung down to a gallery on the second floor. The thieves scaled a ladder, uh, actually fell, climbed back up, <laughs> and were able to uh, break a window, and then swiftly retrieve the painting. And then they left a note before they made their departure that read, Thanks for the poor security. It's pretty funny. Uh, The following month, a ransom of 1 million U.S. dollars was demanded, but the National Gallery refused to pay. Instead, the Norwegian authorities set up a joint sting operation with Britain's Metropolitan Police's Covert Operations Group and Los Angeles' J. Paul Getty Museum security team. Uh, Charles Hill was one of the British detectives responsible for the retrieval of the scream. He posed as an American art dealer buying the Getty Museum, or buying, excuse me, for the Getty Museum, and he was able to trick the thieves pretty quickly into showing him the painting, and then law enforcement went and did the rest to recover it once they knew where, where it was. Uh, with the Gardner theft, Hill first claimed that infamous Boston mobster and definite future suck subject Whitey Bulger acquired the paintings and then gave the stolen works to the IRA, which allegedly has trafficked stolen art in the past. Why was Hill suspicious of Bulger? Well, in 1998, the public and Hill learned that the Boston FBI office uh, had a long partnership with Whitey Bulger, a major Boston crime boss and FBI informant. Bulger and his associates helped the FBI bring down a leading Italian crime family in Boston, and Bulger was offered protection for doing so. Bulger had paid guys on the FBI, uh, would be warned about upcoming wiretaps, and was protected from being investigated by other agencies. Hill thinks he was one of the few guys in the Boston area at the time who could have pulled off getting the art out of the area and sold without getting caught. He had the clout, the protection, and the connections. Charles Hill spoke to the Masonian back in 2005 and said, The paintings are in the west of Ireland, and the people holding them are a group of criminals about the hardest, the most violent, and the most difficult cases you are ever likely to encounter. They have the paintings and they don't know what to do with them. All we need to do is convince them to return them. I see that as my job. He said that he believed that Bulger shipped the paintings to Ireland between 1990 and 1995 
saying, being extremely clever, knowing that he could negotiate the paintings for money or for a bargaining chip, he took them. Only Bulger could have done it at that time. Only Bulger had the Bureau protecting him. Moving the pictures was easy, most probably in a shipping container with no explosives or drugs for a dog to sniff. He thought Ireland meant safety for him and the museum staff. Hill added, he went to Ireland hoping to hide out there. When they threw him out, they hung on to his things, not knowing what to do with them. Uh, Hill said that he was in delicate negotiations that could lead him to the paintings, saying, I have someone who says he can arrange for me to visit them. If you will forgive me, I would rather not tell you their names right now. Uh, But then the art was not found. It still wasn't found six years later uh, after Bulger Santa Monica arrest in 2011, after his 16 years on the run came to an end. Hill now changed his theory and claimed that Bulger was peripherally involved, maybe. Uh, He now states, uh, stated he believed that two thieves loosely affiliated with the IRA, but not acting on its behalf, came from Ireland to commit the theft. Hill told Bloomberg in 2020, two clues jump out at me. One, the crime happened the night of St. Patrick's Day. (laughs) That seems absurd to me. I mean, it was probably Irish guys. I mean, because it happened on St. Patrick's Day. And who steals on St. Patrick's Day? (laughs) The Irish. They'll do anything on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, And then two, one of the robbers used the word mate (laughs) when he tied up the security guards. That's not a word Americans say. Uh, all right. This guy doesn't impress me. He has an impressive resume, but this does not impress. Uh, a f- former guard, though, Randy Hestand, uh, he wrote to Bloomberg in an email following this article and stated that although one of the thieves did use the word mate, he said, I never had any reason to think they were from outside North America. Hestand still believes they were American or Canadian based on how they sounded. Nevertheless, according to Hill, a man named Martin the Viper Foley, a protege of IRA-affiliated criminal Martin Cahill, is for sure a key player. He currently thinks that Foley was not involved in the theft, but knows where the paintings are. Hill told Bloomberg, Martin is worried. He's concerned that if he comes forward with the paintings, he'll be prosecuted. In February of 2020, the Irish Irish Supreme Court ruled that Foley owed over $800,000 in back taxes, and then he went into hiding, according to Hill. Uh, Hill still has not recovered shit from the Gardner heist, so everything you just heard might be total speculation and bullshit. The IRA and or Irish organized crime in the Boston area might not know anything about the artwork. Uh, as mentioned, the timeline, the FBI in 2015 stated that the two guys formerly associated with uh, Carmelo Merlino, they're considered the main suspects in the robbery. And if I had to bet my life after going through this over and over again on which two guys took the artwork, I would pick Merlino's guys. Carmelo Merlino was a uh, patri- patriarcha family underboss. Patriarca uh, Antonio Banderas, uh, Steven Seagal, uh, Tortellini Spaghetti. He was, uh, that's Italian for saying what I just said. Uh, big time New York, England mob, or big time New England mob guy, known Boston gangster. Uh, wasn't afraid of going uh, for a big score. He had been convicted of robbing an armed uh, armored truck for over half a million dollars back in 1968. Uh, the New York Times reported that on February 12th, 1971, Charles A. Dominico Rocco F. Novello and uh, Carmelo Merlino were all convicted of armed robbery, sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison. When Carmelo was paroled in the 80s, he then opened an auto repair garage called TRC Auto Electric Co. in Dorchester. Uh, he and his associates would come to be known by law enforcement as the TRC Auto Electric Gang. According to FBI agent Jeff Kelly, the Gardner heist may have been planned at Carmelo's garage at the TRC Auto Electric headquarters. Uh, Merlino was arrested in 1994 for running a cocaine trafficking ring out of his garage. After his arrest, Merlino spoke about having access to the stolen Gardner paintings. A few years later, the FBI put an undercover informant in Carmelo's garage and recorded him speaking with associates about these paintings. Merlino and the informant plotted a robbery of an armored car depot in Easton, Massachusetts. Merlino and three others were then arrested and were told that all charges would be completely dropped if they would just lead agents to the stolen art. But Merlino would not provide that information. And on November 22, 2002, Merlino was sentenced to 47 years in prison. He told the judge the government pulled a real fast one. And then Merlino died in prison three years later in 2005 at the age of 71. Did he just not know where the art was? Had he uh, been bullshitting? Or did he know if he said where the art was, he'd be ratting on someone who would have him killed? Or, you know, it's just like, a, you know, his, his own moral code. He just was re- refused to rat on someone that he cared about, you know, a member of his uh, kind of criminal family. The FBI theorized that two of Merlino's associates, George Reisfelder and Leonard or Lenny DiMuzio, were the two fake cops uh, led into the museum and that David Turner and other associates were possibly also involved. Uh, Reisfelder and DeMuzio both died in 1991. As I said, so if they did steal that shit, right? Uh, they for sure did not live out the fantasy I talked about up top. 
Rice Felder had got out of prison in 1982 after serving 15 years for murder. His relatives later told the authorities that they were sure they saw a painting hanging over his bed that they believe was the Shea Tortoni. Uh, Rice Felder died of a cocaine overdose in March of 1991. He was found in his apartment, not a mansion, and the painting was not there. And then 43-year-old Demuzio shot to death in June of 1991. Again, uh, a gangland hit. David Turner, also part of Camarlo Marlino's crew. Uh, 1992, Turner's fingerprints were sent to the FBI lab to determine if they could be found on stolen items, but the tests were inconclusive. Turner was nabbed in an FBI sting in 1999 while trying to rob an armored car. Released in 2019, FBI still considers him a suspect, but again, they got nothing and the years keep ticking along. So now let's look at some other gangster possibilities, some other organized crime affiliates thought to be connected to this heist somehow. In May of 2014, FBI lead investigator Jeff Kelly told Boston's Fox 25 that some of the paintings were seen as recently as 2000. At that time, stolen works were put up for sale in Philadelphia. Kelly said, from expanding our investigation and expanding the world in which we're investigating, we've identified a number of individuals who reported that they'd seen the paintings being offered for sale in Philadelphia. Kelly named the three key players. Again, Carmelo Morlino and uh, Robert Guarente and Robert Gentile also known as Bobby, uh, Bobby Gentile, and sometimes Bobby Guarente. Uh, so we know about Merlino already. Like Merlino, uh, Guarente and Gentile, also dead. Bobby Guarente was a Boston mob associate who died of cancer in 2004. He was a convicted bank robber with ties to both the Boston and Philadelphia mob, uh, worked for Merlino, another member of the so-called TRC Auto Electric Gang. In 2010, Guarente's wife, Aline, she is a character, uh, told the FBI that after her husband got out of prison in 2002, he gave two stolen paintings to a Connecticut mobster named Bobby Gentile at a restaurant in Portland, Maine. The FBI searched Gentile's home multiple times, and they did find a handwritten list of the paintings with potential black market prices hidden in a newspaper. Gentile had offered to sell the paintings to an undercover FBI agent for half a million dollars each. But after he was arrested, he insisted he never had the paintings, didn't know where they were. Uh, he was offered freedom if he could just lead investigators to the artwork, but like Carmelo before, he refused the deal and played dumb or really didn't know anything. Gentile was released from prison in 2019, then died in 2021. 2016, the Boston Globe learned that in 1998, uh, Bobby Guarente told former mob leader Bobby Luisi that he buried some of the art under a concrete slab of a house in Florida. Luisi operated a cocaine trafficking ring outside of his house in 1997. Uh, Bobby Guarente worked for him as a seller. And Bobby Gentile worked as a cook and a security guard. Gentile was a member of the uh, Philadelphia Mafia, worked as a bodyguard for a mafia lieutenant. His criminal record included aggravated assault for stealing stolen goods, illegal gambling, counterfeiting, as well as larceny for mishandling his father's estate. Uh, Gentile worked as a bricklayer, cement mason, ran an Italian restaurant with his brother, and he got his nickname The Cook because he uh, liked to cook for mob associates. Luisi told the FBI that Guarante asked him if he knew how to fence stolen masterpieces because he had two stolen works buried under a concrete slab of a house in Florida. Luisi told him he didn't know how. Luisi was approached by the FBI after he was released from prison in 2012. Weeks later, not coincidentally, the FBI raided Bobby Gentile's home, but they didn't find the art. In 2018, the FBI ex uh, excavated a lot in Orlando, looking for some of the paintings, but still failed to uncover the art. Uh, we know that Bobby Gentile was friends with Bobby Guarente. Searches of Gentile's home near Hartford, Connecticut, did not lead to the recovery of the artwork, but the police did find, you know, a piece of typewriter paper with a with a list of 13 stolen items and what they might sell for on the black market again. Guarante indicted for trafficking cocaine in 1999. The cocaine allegedly came from the Merlino family in Philadelphia. Both Guarante and Robert uh, Luisi Jr. were allegedly members of the Merlino crime family. Luisi and Guarante indicted for being part of a cocaine ring in Boston. Gentile told the Boston Globe that he drove Luisi to Philadelphia because Luisi was looking to expand his loan sharking operations and needed permission from Carmelo Morino. Uh, Gentile was asked if the, you know, Gardner heist came up at all, and he denied speaking to Luisi or anyone else in Philadelphia about the Gardner paintings. When Luisi was called before a federal grand jury, he testified that Gentile uh, did talk to him about the possibility of putting together a crew to knock over some armed car deliveries to and from Foxwoods Casino. Luisi initially agreed to cooperate with federal investigators, but then stopped cooperating. Claimed he had found Jesus and wanted to counsel others in prison. Or the fucking mob got to him. Luisi's conviction was overturned and he was released. FBI searched the shed in Gentile's backyard in Connecticut, believing the stolen artwork was there, but again, nothing. In April of 2012, Gentile was indicted on drug charges, arrested after a sting operation for selling narcotic painkillers. Uh, Gentile and his lawyer thought that he should uh, take a lie detector test to get around the charges. 
If he passed, he could convince prosecutors that he didn't know what the fucking art was and they would drop the drug charges. But he failed the polygraph. Took the test again, admitted that he had seen the miniature self-portrait by Rembrandt after it was stolen. The machine said he was telling the truth. He claimed that Aline Guarente showed it to him a long time ago saying it was tiny like a postage stamp. She pulled it out of her bra where she was hiding it to show me. (laughs) Sweet. Uh, She told me he was going to provide for her retirement. Maybe get her a house in Florida with it. When Gentile was first approached by investigators after the 2010 tip from Aline Guarente, he said, sure, I knew Bobby. And yeah, maybe we did talk about the Gardner case, but it was only to talk about how great it would be to get that $5 million reward. Guarente never had any of those paintings and he certainly never gave me any of them. Gentile's lawyer, Ryan McGuire, uh, his name actually looks like it's Ryan McGuire. Maybe McGuire. <laughs> I'm going to say it's Ryan McGuire. That's very funny to me. His lawyer, old Ryan McGuire, uh, asked for one last meeting in the U.S. Attorney's Office to try and in- to convince investigators that Gentile was telling the truth. And McGuire practically begged Gentile to tell them what he knew. But Gentile said, in your right mind, do you think I would hold out if I knew something? I know there's a $5 million reward here. Do you think I would deny my family $5 million and get these charges off my back if I could? I'll tell you again, I don't know anything. And whoever's telling you different is lying. A few days later, on May 10th, 2012, FBI agents search his house and search his house in Manchester, Connecticut. In the basement, they find, you know, that sheet of paper, uh, you know, uh, tucked into a Boston Herald paper reporting on the theft, the one with the 13 pieces and the potential prices. But, you know, it says it doesn't know anything. The search of Gentile's home takes place in February again of 2012. Authorities find illegal firearms and silencers in addition to the handwritten list. On April 17th, 2014, now 79-year-old Bobby Gentile is arrested by FBI agents for selling a 38 revolver on March 2nd to an unidentified confidential informant. He had been on probation after a 2013 conviction for weapons possession and illegal sale of narcotics. He served one year and was released to, uh, due to poor health. The FBI hoped that this second sting operation would force him to disclose the location of the stolen art. After the first arrest, Gentile said he knew nothing about the art, right? They, they searched his property. They, they can't fucking find it. They offered to drop the charges, give him some reward money. His attorney said it would be illogical for him to withhold information if he did have it. Uh, did have it. And then again, he does not pass that polygraph when questioned about the heist. At a 2015 hearing, prosecutor said Bobby was recorded telling an undercover agent he had access to at least two of the paintings though and could sell them for half a million each, as as I mentioned. Uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney John H. Durham said in court on April 20th, 2015, there is a 99% certainty that Mr. Gentile was lying when he said he didn't know anything about the Gardner Museum robbery before it happened. He had never seen any of the Gardner paintings and didn't know where any of them were. And then attorney Ryan McGuire said that Gentile was only guilty of braggadocio and a thirst for attention. So my client was talking about a fictitious deal with an FBI plant. It's all made up talk. Eh, 2016, Gentile's associate, Sebastian Mazzucato, uh claimed the Gentile had access to the stolen art, had it since the late 90s, uh, when his gang supposedly took the art from the original thieves. Mazzucato and his cousin worked with the FBI in a sting operation and recorded Gentile, talking about the possible sale of the stolen paintings. But then uh, Gentile became suspicious of his associates and the operation failed. Gentile maintained his innocence, claimed that the recent charges against him just were a ploy to get him to reveal the location of the artwork, even though he didn't know shit, blah, blah, blah. February 27, 2018, Gentile is sentenced to four and a half years in prison after pleading guilty to illegally selling guns to a convicted murderer. He uh, sentenced to 54 months in prison for selling a pistol to a known killer who wanted to uh, clip a fellow in Maine. <laughs> and that was that informant guy. March, 2009, uh, March 2019, 82-year-old Robert Gentile said to be released from prison after serving 54 months on a firearms charge. And then we'll, we'll wrap up his story in a bit. Let's quickly meet just a couple more gangsters. Miles Connor. Uh, or associates, was described by Smithsonian Magazine as an aging rocker who performed with Roy Orbison before he gained fame as New England's leading art thief. 1975, Connor stole a Rembrandt from the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, Connor has claimed 30 art thefts. He was incarcerated during the Gardner Museum theft, but has bragged that he and a deceased friend named Bobby Donati called the museum before the theft and that Bob, or cased it, excuse me, and that Bobby was one of the thieves. Miles Connor came forward after the museum increased the reward, said he could find the artwork in exchange for immunity, part of the reward, and being released from prison. But authorities rejected his offer. Miles said he was probably told, but I don't remember who has the art, citing a heart attack as the reason for his memory loss, according to the Smithsonian. Bobby Donati was, all these fucking characters, like out of a movie. Uh, Bobby Donati, in and out of jail for robbery, spent time with local mobsters, uh, has never been publicly identified by the FBI as a suspect, but a lot of people implicate him in the heist. 
as having knowledge of what was going on. Uh, September of 1991, Donati attacked outside his home in Revere. His body was found several days later in the trunk of his car a mile from home. He had been stabbed and his throat had been slashed. Damn. Law enforcement speculated that Donati was targeted because of ties to a renegade faction trying to take control of the New England Mafia. Uh, in, a two, in 2011, Miles Connor wrote that he had cased Gardner Museum again with Donati before the theft. Connor also claimed that a friend, David Houghton, visited him in prison after the robbery, told him Donati was one of the thieves. Their plan was to leverage artwork to get Connor released. Houghton died of a heart attack in 1991. Additionally, New England Mafia capo uh, Vincent Ferrara claimed that Donati told him in 1990 that he robbed the museum and buried the stolen art. And he planned to use it to get Ferrara released from prison, according to former Boston Globe reporter Stephen Kirkajan in his book, Master Thieves. And a man named Paul uh, Calantropo uh, claimed that in spring of 1990, Donati came to his office at the Jewelers Building in Boston with that Golden Eagle finial and asked him how much it was worth. Calantropo uh, recognized it as a missing you know, piece, uh, one of the missing pieces from the museum, supposedly refused to touch it. Uh, Kellen Trapo was alone in his office that day. He said he saw someone approach on the security camera. It was Donati. He had known Bobby for decades, had appraised diamonds, jewelry, other items that Donati had brought in, but it made him nervous always because he knew Donati had gone to jail for robbery and was, you know, a, a mob associate. He said Donati showed him that uh, eagle finial, asked him how much it was worth. He recognized it as the piece from the museum and refused to touch it, said it was worthless because the whole world knew it had been stolen. And he said that was the last time he saw Donati. At age 50, Donati was murdered, and his murder remains unsolved. Uh, in November of 2021, Colin Trapo, uh shared his story for the first time. And so I'm kind of repeating things. It's like a little summary and a little more detail. I had a hard time keeping all this straight in my head. Uh, he said he kept quiet before he, uh, because he feared for his safety. Five years earlier, he met with an FBI agent and security director and told him about the meeting with Donati. And uh, this is one of the most recent clues in the Gardner heist. Colin Tropo said he had been working with a retired law enforcement official, two former convicts, and journalist Stephen Kirkajan in April of 2021 said they signed an agreement to split the reward evenly if they gave information leading to the recovery of the artwork. Kirkajan shared the document with the Boston Globe and an account of his work with the group. Kirkajan called Calantropo's story the most authoritative account that I have heard of someone seeing any of the stolen pieces after the theft. Kirkajan also shared a 2016 letter between a federal inmate and museum security chief Anthony Moray. Moray asked if the inmate could provide information about Bobby Donati and another deceased suspect. And he had reason to believe Donati was involved in the theft and possession of our paintings. And my reasons extend far beyond what has been reported in various media reports and books. So there, I mean, there's a lot of information we don't have. And then there is William Youngsworth, or just Youngworth. William is an antiques dealer from Brighton who claimed to have gained access to the stolen artwork in 1997. He said on August 17th of that year, he supposedly showed what he said was the storm of the Sea of Galilee to Boston Herald reporter Tom Mashberg. Mashberg was taken to a warehouse to see what was supposed to be Christ in the storm of the sea on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Mashberg was allowed to see the painting briefly by flashlight. When Mashberg asked for proof of the painting's authenticity, he was given a small vial of paint chips, and that led to negotiations between Youngworth and federal authorities. But experts later confirmed that while these paint chips were Dutch fragments from the 17th century, they were not from the missing painting. Youngworth wanted the reward, immunity from prosecution, dismissal of other charges pending against him, and the release of Miles Connor, but at the end of 1997, the FBI announced that the vial of paint fragments, you know, were not Rembrandt's work. Hmm. Mashberg said, uh, has said that he now believes that the painting he saw was a replica because the painting had a protective coating on it that would have made it impossible to roll up. Now for the final Bobby Gentile details. The mobster was released from prison in March of 2019 due to poor health. Uh, his lawyer spoke about a conversation he had with Gentile when he was near death in 2016, saying... Years ago, I sat next to him in a prison hospital on, his, on you know, what he thought was his deathbed. He wanted to go home. And I told him if he just gave us information on the gardener, he could die with his wife that night in his home. And he said with tears in his eyes, but there ain't no paintings. There ain't no paintings. Hmm. And then uh, Gentile died September 17th, 2021. He was 85. He is believed by many to be the last person alive who really had knowledge about the heist. So all the leads are all done with, right? Maybe not quite. February 27th, 2022, the Boston Globe reported that investigators are now saying that a 1991 murder could be related to the heist. In February of 2022, Anthony Moray told Boston 25 News that a recent tip prompted officials to look into the 1991 murder of a local criminal named Jimmy Marks. Marks was killed while unlocking his front door uh, to his apartment in Lynn, Massachusetts. The killer had unscrewed the light bulb over the door so Marks wouldn't see anything when he opened it, making Marks the victim of a classic mob-style hit. 
according to Boston 25 News. He was shot twice in the back of the head, and then the killer fled the scene. Uh, Amore received a tip that just a few days before Marx was killed, he was heard bragging about having two of the stolen paintings, that he had hidden some of the art. Lynn Deputy Police Chief Mark O'Toole spoke with the Boston Globe and said, Mark had connections to subjects suspected of being involved in the Garden Museum heist. We don't know what, if any, role he had, but very likely was related. Amore said that Jimmy Marks was associated with Bobby Guarente. Uh, his murder remains unsolved. In 2010, when Amore and Jeff Kelly interviewed Aline, right, Guarente, uh, Bobby's wife, widow, she told him that Bobby was friends with an Irish guy named Jimmy, but couldn't remember his last name. But then in subsequent interviews, Elaine said that Bobby killed Jimmy, said Jimmy was a frequent guest at their house in Maine, and she knew him very well, okay? Uh, Marks had spent time in prison for a bank robbery in the 60s. He was a drug dealer with many connections and did spend a lot of time with the Guarantes in Maine. Darlene Finnegan, Mark's niece, said that before he died, just before, he told her he had something big coming up. She thought he was talking about selling cocaine, but maybe he was talking about the artwork. In 2015, Aline uh, Guarante pointed to a picture of Marks in an interview, said that Bobby killed him. Uh, Aline died in 2018. Uh, she sure uh, seems to have possibly known a bunch. Our investigator received a tip in 2010 that Marks hinted that the paintings were hidden inside his apartment. 2015, Alina said her, again, her husband was friends, you know, when he died, admitted to killing him after the fact. Um, back in 2010, Aline also said she saw Bobby give two of the stolen paintings to Gentile. Gentile and Guarente become partners after they met at a used car auction near Hartford in the 70s. We mentioned both of them. Aline said Marks was a regular visitor and her husband followed into Boston, then fucking took him out. A couple days after the Marks murder, detectives found Guarente, Gentile, two Gentile strong arm men in a diner in Saugus. They were looking for someone else at the time, but noticed how the group seemed nervous and tried to leave. Uh, Marx was also acquainted with Leonard DiMuzio, one of the two suspected thieves. Marx was once arrested with Richard Megna, who was DiMuzio's cousin. Another fucking dick. So many dicks in this. Uh, after, uh, and Megna often visited an automotive business in Dorchester that was believed to be the hangout spot for the men who planned the robbery, a.k.a. the TRC Auto Electric Gang. So a lot of people all wrapped up in this mess. Uh, suspect list is over now. Thank God no, one being, no one's being tested on all of that. I know there was a lot of fucking names. So many of them connected. Sounds like Carmelo Marlino's TRC Auto Electric Gang members, George Reisfelder and Leonard DiMuzio, likely were the two fake officers who took the art. Doesn't sound like either one of them went on to live a life of luxury after getting away with it. One was killed by other gangsters. The other OD'd on coke. Maybe it was laced. Both just over a year after the heist. Both died in the Boston area. No sunny beaches for them. And the rest of the crews they worked with doesn't sound like any of them really went on to live luxuriously. They all either spent a lot of time in prison or were shot to death. No one was able to use knowledge of where the art was to cut themselves some generous plea bargain or get the reward money. None of the people suspected of being involved seemed to uh, have lived out some kind of fantasy life at all. Damn. Uh, I never really thought about what happens like, you know, with the uh, with the robbery gang after you pull off something like this successfully. Not really. In the movies, you know, everyone typically celebrates together and then the fucking credits roll. But in real life, if the cops or the feds don't get you, I guess someone else very likely will. Right? It's not like you're hanging out with the, the people with the best morals. If you're hanging out with a bunch of fucking killers, uh, mobsters, and they know you have this shit worth hundreds of millions of dollars, why would they let you live? Why would they just fucking take it from you? You know, they, or maybe you try and sell it and the person just, you know, uh, you're trying to sell it to, they kill you instead of buying it. The public never knows because the people killing you don't want anyone to know why they killed you. It makes me wonder, like, how many people who pull off a heist truly, really get away with it? Like, actually get to, like, keep what they have stolen and profit off of it in the, in the long run. You know, how many, you know, not only don't get caught, but also don't get killed behind the scenes. How many don't have the shit they stole stolen from them behind the scenes? I mean, if that happens, it's not like you can go to authorities and complain about, hey, the stuff I stole got stolen from me. Like, how often does it truly end up in beaches and sunsets and tropical drinks with fucking twirly straws and ladies in bikinis and easy living, you know, for the for the rest of a long laughter and sex filled life? I don't think very often at all. I bet hardly ever. I think crime typically really doesn't pay. Not in the long run. You know, but it could pay right now if you truly know where this shit is and you can get that fucking 10 mil. Come on. Statue of limitations is long up. The museum just wants their stuff back. Time now. For today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, in just 81 minutes, approximately $600 million worth of art was stolen from the Garden Museum. But the choice of artwork stolen has always perplexed investigators. 
Some of the most valuable paintings in the museum, like the Rape of Europa, Rembrandt's self-portrait, Left Behind, while seemingly random pieces like the Golden Eagle and an old Chinese wine vase were taken. Number two, although security guard Richard Ricky Dick Abbott has always denied being involved in the heist, investigators are still highly suspicious of him based on his behavior before and during the heist. How has he not been killed by fucking mobsters? Did he help those mobsters? The day before the heist, Abbott opened a side door, the same door used by the thieves, and allowed an unknown man inside the museum during the night shift. The next day, during his rounds of the museum, he entered the blue room on the first floor twice. Small painting was stolen from that room. Abbott is the only one, you know, that the uh, motion detectors documented going inside that room the, the fucking around the time it was stolen. Maybe when he hit that dead concert in a borrowed van, a Manet painting was riding shotgun. Number three, there are so many suspects for the heist, from infamous mobster Whitey Bulger to infamous art thief Miles Connor. Although the suspects have made allegations about each other, none of them have ever actually been charged with the Gardner Museum theft. Now almost uh, all of the potential suspects are dead. Last person considered maybe to be uh, you know, directly involved, Bobby Gentile died in September of 2021. Number four, Isabella Stewart Gardner, the founder of the Gardner Museum, was an extremely rich woman with a passion for collecting art whose last name was not Pigfucker. She and her husband, Jack Gardner, traveled the world collecting priceless works of art for their personal collection. After Jack died of a stroke, Isabella brought their shared dream of opening an art museum to fruition. Uh, she designed the museum herself, well, you know, with the help of an architect, uh, remains exactly as she uh, set things up today, excluding one small section of museum. And her museum is not called the Pigfucker Museum. It is known as the Gardner Museum. Gardner, not Pigfucker. Please don't call it Pigfucker. Number five, new info. I want to mention some anonymous letters. In April of 1994, then museum director Ann Hawley received an anonymous letter postmarked from New York City. The second sentence offered information that had never really been made public that the uniforms were not actually police uniforms as written about in the press, but security guard uniforms that looked a lot like Boston PD uniforms. And also said, I want to point out that I had no part in the theft and really only became aware of it in the past six months. Further, I do not know the identity of the two men who did the actual robbery. I am dealing with a third party. All parties do want a resolution to everyone's satisfaction. You get the collection and they get some money and immunity from prosecution. The writer claimed that the art was still in good condition and they could facilitate the return of the art if they received $2.6 million and an assurance that they would not be arrested. Holly gave the letter to the FBI. Special agent in charge at the time, Richard Swenson, how many fucking Richards are in this story, ordered agents to stand down during the negotiations. Swenson also went to the Boston Globe and asked them to put the numeral one in the currency box in the Sunday edition of the Boston Globe per the request of the writer. Uh, who wrote, for example, this week, the LIRA in American dollars, or yeah, they capitalize it, the lira, in American dollars is 0. 0.000618. Using that as a base, the following formula must not be used to indicate your interest, or, or excuse me, must be used. Not interested equals 0. 0.000619. Agree equals 1.000618. Editor uh, Matthew Storin agreed to it. But did not make it clear that the paper should be told first if the art was returned. Storin put the lira in the middle of, of the row and put it in the Globe May 1st, 1994. And Holly then gets another letter the next week. And the writer says that they are alarmed by the aggressive reaction by investigators after the museum received the first letter. They made it clear that they could have the paintings or they could try and criminally pursue those who took the paintings. But you cannot have both in all caps. Right now, I need time to both think and start the process to ensure confidentiality of the exchange. The writer then said it was now impossible to continue negotiations and they would provide clues to the artwork's whereabouts, but the museum never received another letter. What aggressive reaction by investigators that they're referring to here uh, has never been made clear. Might have been nothing. So, you know, bummer. Maybe the one real chance uh, they had to get that shit back uh, might have been blown somehow back in 1994. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Heists. The $600 million Gardner Museum robbery has been sucked. A little deviation from our normal type of true crime. Kind of a complicated situation there on the back end with all those suspects. Uh, I hope it made sense. I cleaned it up as best I feel like I could. Uh, but I found the story very interesting. Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making time suck again this week. Uh, big thank you to Lindsay Cummins for running a million things behind the scenes. Let me stay focused on this stuff. Uh, try and crack these puzzles. Thanks to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., for producing and directing today. To the Art Warlock, Logan Keith, for helping with production. Thanks also to Bitalexer for upkeep on the Time Suck app. The Art Warlock, Logan again, for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com. 
for helping run our socials along with the Suck Ranger and a team managed by our social media strategist, Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee again for the initial research this week. And thanks to the All Seeing Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over on the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. Uh, next week on Time Suck, we go nuclear. That's probably how I'm going to say it. Uh, with the Three Mile Island disaster, we just touched on this with the uh, Sullivan- Sullivanian cult madness recently. Now we're going to go further as our topic voting Patreon space lizards have decreed. In the early hours of Wednesday, March 28th, 1979, Pennsylvania Governor Thornbur- Thornburg excuse me, received a telephone call from the State Director of Emergency Management, Colonel Oren Henderson. It was news of a problem that, in Thornburg's words, no governor anywhere had ever had to face. And I'm not sure that's how you say his last name. I'll, I'll figure it out for next week. Uh, the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant located in the middle of the uh, Susquehanna River near the state's capital of Harrisburg had suffered an accident. Answers to the question of what precisely had happened, and especially the question of what effects the accident would have for public safety were unclear. The immediate task to simply get the facts proved much easier said than done. Experts just were not sure. In the beginning, they weren't sure of how it started, how severe it was going to be, and how much radiation would be released into the atmosphere, potentially killing people, a lot of people. Contradictory statements being issued by the officials from Metropolitan Edison, the utility company, federal regulators, and other groups stoked fear and paranoia in residents of the surrounding areas, and soon things were in a state of all-out chaos for many. It seemed to be exactly the type of thing the detractors of nuclear programs had been worried about, beginnings of some man-made nuclear apocalypse. Back at the plant, experts and employees quickly worked to fix the nuclear reactor and prevent large amounts of radiation from escaping from the facility. Did they succeed? What exactly happened at Three Mile Island? And was the government truthful about what happened? All of this and more next week on Time Suck. And right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Our first update comes in from an anonymous super sucker who is convinced that I'm trying to kill him. Maybe I am. They're right. I'm on to you, fucker. It's happened so many times it can't be coincidence. I'm an electrician in the great Pacific Northwest, and it seems every time I'm on a ladder doing something overhead or in an awkward position, you Superman (laughs) punch my ear socket with an Italian masterclass or some Whipple horse shit. Always when I'm least expecting it and my focus is elsewhere. From one fighting man to another. Fight, 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 fight. That's low blow. Or that's, uh, sorry, that's low, bro. I'm not joking when I say I've almost fallen off a ladder laughing. So thank you for that. But seriously, thank you for all the knowledge and laughs. I'm newer to Time Suck about a year. I'm a binge list. I am binge listening to you and your twisted mind on every job I'm able to. I'm about three quarters of the way through the catalog and I love all the ridiculous dark humor laced with knowledge. Goes together like Maserati's and Amitables. Uh, I also respect the shit. I also respect the shit out of you. I can't imagine how hard it is to wade through the hot button topics you take on in today's trigger happy cancel culture environment, but you do it and you genuinely try to see both sides, which is rare nowadays. It's easy to take a hard stance against pedos and serial killers. Agreed, it is. Uh, but you tackle religion, guns, racism, etc. Uh, well done, sir. If you read this on the podcast, please leave out my last name in the off chance my safety coordinator and or many bosses will hear this and come chew my ass. Also, give a shout out to Joel Stokes. Use his last name because fuck that guy, LOL. <laughs> he got me into time sucking. He's a good dude. Oh, and tell him to get back in the hole and keep digging. Hail Nimrod, keep on sucking. Well, thank you, Anonymous. And get back in your fucking hole, Joel Stokes, you piece of shit. Uh, wait, actually, you've been spreading the suck. No, why would I bash you? No, uh, please go back in your hole. If you would prefer, you find gentlemen. And yeah, thanks for the, the, yeah, the words about trying to see things from both sides. I do work to do that. It's so easy not to. And it annoys me more as I get older when so many people do. And I, and I know that some people genuinely tend to line up, you know, uh, morally, ideologically, whatever, you know, with one side much stronger than the other. But even then, to be super dismissive of a side, it just doesn't fucking get anywhere. And I just think it's uh, generally pretty childish and, and just mindless and, and just uh, a lot of kind of pandering virtue signaling. You know, it's, uh, you know, you, you pick like, oh, okay, uh, this side likes these talking points. And I always say I'm this and I always say I'm that. And I never say I'm this. And it's, I don't know. I think it's fairly easy to understand like what minds to avoid stepping on. But, but I just, I don't know. I try not to think of, I try to think a little bit more like rationally and logically. And 
I don't, I just think it's in everybody's best interest for us to, you know, compromise as much as we can and and be a stronger society that way, as opposed to fracturing out and going into our little kind of, you know, echo chambers. And, uh, and I've been saying this on the standup shows lately. I hopefully I said it for the special, but I probably didn't because I always come up with the best lines for stuff after I record something. But, uh, uh, talking towards the end there, I'm like, you know, it, it's easier to, you know, just deal with people that you agree with. I do get that. But we learn so much more from people who don't agree with us, right? That dialogue, uh, that really evolves us in in more important ways. You know, yeah, you, you know, you, you, uh, yeah, I just think you grow a lot more when you look at things from the other side. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, right back in when you finally fall off that ladder and really hurt yourself, please. Uh, next up, a sweet sack writing in is Ash No Name who needs a little cheering up. They write, hello, Suckmaster Cummins. It's your faithful sucker, Ash. I listen to your podcast every day at work while I deliver everyone's packages. Oh, it's a tough job. Thank you. I'll try to keep this short because it's really important that you read this. This week has been the worst week of my life. My boyfriend, who also listened to the suck, lost his job and it has recently fallen on me to cover the bills right now. Tonight, I was not in a good state of mind, uh, feeling like a boiling pot of water inside. I felt desperate, like I should go to the, new, the emergency room for help, but I knew I couldn't because I would have to return to work. I wanted to thank you because... In my time of need, you, sir, were there telling me I couldn't let you down or mess this up for you because you need all your listeners. Nimrod spoke through you as a conduit telling me to contact the crisis hotline, and I did, and they were very helpful. That's fucking awesome. Uh, They asked me questions, helped ease my mind. I will live to suck another day. Thank you for everything you and Lizzie and the team do for the podcast community you have here. Please, if you could read this, could you give a shout out to my grandma Rose and mother Dawn for having my back this week? They are two amazing women. I will end this by saying I will keep on sucking. Well, yes, Ash, no name. You will keep on sucking. And thank you, Rose and Don, for supporting baby girl. Uh, the world always needs more sweet suckers. Uh, the assholes, they never seem to take themselves out, do they? And Hitler doesn't count, right? They're going to kill him. He knew that. Uh, but really, right, push through the dark days with the hope that unexpected sunshine could be uh, right up there around the corner because that does happen. It's happened to me. And remember that your family needs you. Uh, I do hope things turn around and soon in the meantime, Maybe maybe take this advice. Uh, it doesn't cost anything to have your husband fuck your brains out, right? While he's got a little time off. Tell him to fucking knock that pussy out, right? Give you, give you a big ass endorphin rush to help kind of fucking put you in a happier place. Make him eat that pussy. No name, Ash. Uh, hail Lucifina and keep on pushing forward. Uh, next up, Callie calling in with an old update that's new to her that I would like to share with you. Uh, good morning, Master Reverend Dr. Sucker. I found your podcast a while back ago. And because that's how I am, I must start from the beginning and listen in order. I like it. I get it. I can get a little rigid about stuff like that. Uh, I've wanted to send updates before, but I thought it would be ridiculous being years behind the eight ball. However, after listening to your suck on Catherine Knight and hearing some of the updates since, I cannot stop thinking about sending this. So here I am. I'm a lawyer and have defended and prosecuted individuals charged with domestic violence. I worked in Cincinnati, Ohio, downtown back in 2010. I give that reference because this was not some backcountry Appalachian Billy Boys and Lawless community, <laughs> uh, but rather a large city a decade into our current century. There was a judge while I was practicing there who was vocal that he did not believe women could be the offender against men and other judges that although weren't vocal, definitely in their rulings had similar feelings. This is even more important than any singular case because when law enforcement officers see a judge's findings uh, of those that they arrest is not guilty, that does that affect how they go about deciding whether to arrest or even write up a report going forward. So you've mentioned that uh, domestic violence likely is not reported because the men don't want to admit it due to highly masculinized cultures. And that is definitely true, but it goes much further than the victim not wanting to admit it to not wanting to admit to being a victim to others or even themselves. The issue also includes that male victims would not be taken seriously or believed at all levels from the police to the courts. In just the past 10 years, I've really started to see a shift, though, in the feelings towards who can be a victim of domestic violence. Thank you for sucking. I continue to need that, Callie. Well, Callie, I am glad that you are seeing a shift. Uh, that is that is very good. Uh, scary that even judges have a hard time with nuance. Man, that kind of like speaks to what I was talking about earlier. People just, it's such fucking lazy thinking. This always works this way. These people can never do that. And then you just get to fucking, yep. I'm going to file that uh, whole category of human in this little file and not have to fucking work those brain muscles ever again. No, man, life is fucking complicated. Uh, To fail to recognize that is just ignorant. Uh, Some men can definitely be physically abused by some women. That is real. It is valid. It is fucking logical. Not every guy is built like an NFL linebacker. 
Not every woman is built like a helpless princess. And then outside of builds, there's, you know, temperaments to consider. Uh, and those judges, though, they should have just watched some fucking women's MMA and CrossFit videos. Holy shit. I could hop on Instagram and find the names of 10 women in about 30 seconds who could beat the ever-loving shit out of me 10 out of 10 times. And I'm not a tiny guy. Uh, I hope that episode can still change a few more uh, people's minds about the subject of female versus male domestic violence. Yeah, it's very real. Uh, get help if it's happening to you. It's not funny, right? And you could you could die from it. And the last one, another Tiananmen Square update from a hot heart Chinese mother mommy. Mother mommy not doesn't sound good. <laughs> That's even creepier than father daddy. Anyway. This this uh, this sucker writes uh, anonymous sucker writes hi Dan and the Bad Magic crew. This is my first time writing in. I started listening to Time Suck at the beginning of the pandemic and finally caught up to the current episode this week. This was pretty coincidental for me as my mother witnessed some of the events of June fourth, and I thought I would share her story. And thank you for doing so. I fucking love firsthand information like this. Uh, my mom was from Sichuan Province and attended university in Chengdu, Sichuan's capital. This was just a couple of years after the CPC finally allowed universities to reopen again following a 10-year shutdown of higher education. That is insane. The CPC justified this because they considered education to be too bourgeoisie. Of course they did. Because of the shutdown, there was a lack of qualified professionals. Fuck yeah. Uh, and university graduates didn't uh, job search. Uh, you were assigned work positions by your program committee, and that was pretty much your only choice. Man. For many new graduates like my mom, that meant having to relocate halfway across the country. My mom was assigned to work in Tianjin, which is an hour away from Beijing. My mom was visiting a friend in Beijing and on the weekend on the weekend of the massacre, they had originally planned to join the demonstrations in Tiananmen Square on Saturday, June 3rd, but her friend's uncle, a police officer, warned them not to leave the house that day because something dangerous was going to happen. Man, my mom and her friend listened to the uncle's advice, stayed home cooking, doing chores, watching movies into the evening. My mom had to catch the train back to Tianjin on Sunday, but still wanted to see what was going on at Tiananmen Square. So she and her friend made their way towards the scare, uh, the square on her friend's bike early Sunday morning. Oh my God. As they got close, they ran into a large group of people running away from the square and soon after heard gunshots. The PLA were firing into the fleeing crowd. My mom and her friend immediately turned and also started running. At this point, they couldn't ride on the bike anymore because the streets were too crowded. So my mom's friend was pushing the bike as they fled. My mom suggested to her friend to abandon the bike because having to push it would slow them down, but her friend refused. This turned out to be a good decision on her friend's part because at that time, bikes had to have uh, registered license plates and could be used to track its owner down. Uh, in the days following the massacre, several people who had their bikes in the vicinity of Tiananmen Square were arrested. Oof. My mom and my friend were able to make it back to their friend's house without getting hurt. Soon after, my mom caught the train back to Tianjin. When she returned to her office, she was taken aside and questioned her about, about her activities that weekend by management because my mom was out of province and out of province worker. She was living in the company dormitory and whenever tenants were gone overnight, they had to report their absence, the reason for their absence, where they would be staying and anticipate a date of return. What the fuck? What a fucking insane way to live. Therefore management knew that my mom uh, was in Beijing and were worried that my mom was directly involved in the protests because they would get into trouble with the company CPC committee. Thankfully, she was able to convince management that she was just visiting a friend and that was the last of it. To this day, my mom credits her friend's uncle with saving her life because if she went to Tiananmen Square like she had originally planned, there was a high chance she could have died. My family moved to Canada in 2002, but even so, my parents are still reluctant to talk about what they experienced during the Cultural Revolution and we don't usually talk Chinese politics outside of the family. If you do choose to share this, please keep it anonymous. Anyways, I love the podcast and uh, and the balance of research and humor. Three out of five stars would not change a thing. Keep on sucking anonymous. Well, anonymous. Uh, yeah, congratulations on your on your family getting out. And that is so insane about that education ban. And just, yeah, just that every glimpse I get into China behind the scenes, I'm like, what the fuck is happening over there? And, you know, and it really, it fucking bums me out actually when athletes and various people are, uh, you know, very pro China publicly. I'm like, what are you fucking doing? Are they just, are they just able to pay you that much money where you're able to fucking show yourself that way and, and pretend that this shit fuck government is not, uh, an oppressive nightmare. And I know this was a while back, but there's still pieces of shit as far as their government fucking communism is a fucking nightmare. People who are huge fans of it, I think are just idealistic people who have read a few books 
and, you know, theorize about it. Oh, let's share everything. I'll be buddy, buddy. And just somehow magically forget that every fucking time it becomes horrifically oppressive and just a humanitarian crisis. So yeah, glad your family's in crisis. Thank you for sharing that. And so fucking glad I'm not over there under the thumb of those naughty, hot, hard Chinese father daddies covered in soy sauce and oppression. Uh, Thank you for the updates, everybody. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thank you for listening to another Bad Magic uh, Productions podcast. <laughs> I don't know I had, to, I had to pause. Think about the name of my own production company I've said it a million times. Don't commit any heist this week. Just watch Ocean, Ocean's Eleven and pretend that you're George Clooney or Brad Pitt or Bernie Mac or something. Right? That's fun. No one goes to fucking prison. No one gets whacked by a mobster. It works out better than the movies. So just do that and keep on sucking. <laughs> Bad Magic Productions. I'm uh, I'm glad I we brought back the Whipple Chill this week because I I gotta say I, I like that music, and and I like really slowing it down and talking that voice. But how horrible would it be if the whole episode was like that? Hey baby, on March 18th, 1990, two men disguised as Boston police officers. They entered the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum and they overpowered two security guards on duty. In just 81 smooth minutes, the thieves stole over $600 million worth of historic art. And baby, that was valued at uh, over $200 million at the time. Mm, mm mm-mm. The Gardner Museum heist remains the biggest art theft in the world, baby. And the biggest private property theft in U.S. history. Oh, man, listen to those tickling those keys. Oh, man. 33 years later, oh, the case still remains unsolved. Uh uh uh. The FBI has followed tips around the world and interviewed. Museum employees. Oh, I like that. I got a little lick there. And a variety of convicted felons. Possum officers and more, you know. They believe that they do know who is responsible for the crimes. Who may have organized a theft or been involved in, in some way. And where the stolen works traveled after the heists. But the problem is, they have no idea where the stolen art is right now. And it's getting harder and harder to figure out where it could be with every passing year. Almost everyone who is likely involved in the Gardner Museum heist is dead. Possibly taking over 600 million worth of secrets to their graves. God, I thought there was a saxophone coming in at some point. I thought I was sure I'd heard it earlier. I was going to end on that, but I don't recall what, what the hell. Come on. <laughs> ah, fuck. Well, I, I can't give you. These episodes would be fucking 17 hours long.